second. All right, we are recording. Orca, are you all right? All right. Um, so we'll get started. My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is January the 10th, 2022. It's 11 a.m. and I call this meeting to order. So uh, this is the new day and time um, that the board intends to hold its regular meetings. Um, we're still kind of monitoring the COVID situation, uh, but until further notice, um, the physical location for these meetings uh, is the CCB headquarters, uh, 89 Main Street in Montpelier. Uh, just a few administrative details to cover. Um, we'll be holding our official public comment meeting um, on the first of our two rules, uh, the first two of our five rules, I should say, uh, this Friday, January 14th at 11 a.m. Um, this meeting will be live streamed, so please feel free to attend remotely, um, but the physical location will be our offices here. Um, we've officially transitioned the medical program uh, to the CCB. Um, we're very excited to welcome the registry staff, Melissa, Meredith, and Lindsay um, to the Cannabis Board. They have worked incredibly hard to ensure that there's a continuity of services and operations during this transition. Um, if you're a patient or a caregiver, please note that the same phone number that you've always used is still operational. That's 802-241-5115. Um, the same website um, will be operational um, while we, at least for the next month, while we transition into the CCB. Um, and uh, if you want to send us anything though, or send them the registry, if you want to um, submit a paper renewal or application, uh, please send it to the CCB now. And again, that's 89 Main Street, third floor, Montpelier, Vermont, 05620. Uh, you should have gotten a notice if you're a patient or a caregiver about this transition with all this information, but just want to make sure um, everyone knows that. Um, other than that, we had a really great discussion with our advisory committee last Thursday um, regarding some of the policy recommendations that the board needs to make for our January 15th report. Uh, we're going to be discussing um, those decisions in greater detail later today. So why don't we just go ahead and turn to the agenda. Um, but first, we should approve the minutes from January 4th. You guys had a chance to look at those? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So um, looking at the agenda, um, we left off last week talking about some additional tiers of licensing, um, you know, specifically uh, a cottage manufacturing tier. Um, and I thought that we should return to that conversation. We all kind of decided to look at um, the regulations around the cottage industry in Vermont, as well as the regulations that we're going to require for tier two product manufacturers um, and i thought that we should just pick up where we left off so julie do you want to start with that um i can or kyle can i think we both have had thoughts on this feel free okay um so you know when i brought this up it was the, the problem i was trying to solve was how do we encourage people who have skills and talent in manufacturing and are able to do that in a small scale at their homes now, but aren't ready for a variety of different reasons. Either they don't have the investments or they're not prepared or they maybe they want it to be a side gig and not a full-time gig, um, not prepared to do a full-time, full-scale manufacturing facility. So I and the reason I think this is a problem we need to solve is I do think that it, it um, meets the portion of our vision that we've talked about as it relates to social equity and encouraging folks from the legacy market into the regulated market. Um, I think we have some existing structures in place, which you've just mentioned, the home occupation structure, and our, um, 24 VSA, and then of course the home based, I, I thought about it mostly in terms of food manufacturing. Um, so we have some food, home based food manufacturing uh, rules already outlined in Vermont. Um, and a long history of, of businesses starting that way. So um, Andrew Livingston in our October 1st meeting, we asked about cottage licensing and he posed a couple of questions. 
Um, he did say that you know some of our existing cottage rules are making their way into regulations other in the other places in the country. But I asked some questions and I used that to sort of frame my thinking. So like, would we inspect people's kitchens? Um, what would be the volume restrictions? Because most uh, home occupation or small um, home-based businesses do have some sort of um, limitation. Actually in Vermont, if I've read this correctly, and certainly anything, I, I'm not an attorney, so this is all from a layperson's perspective. <laughs> Um, it seems like if you're under a certain amount, you're actually exempt from getting a license if you're doing that home-based food manufacturing. Certainly, we can't exempt people from licenses if they're adding THC to their product, right? It has to be regulated. Um, and he asked where the packaging would occur and what the safety and sanitation requirements and what the testing requirements would, would be. Um, in terms of inspecting people's home kitchens, I think that's already included in the home-based business food manufacturing licensing. It already requires you to have um, someone come and look at your kitchen and we could certainly take that existing structure and and overlay it into our structure I, think. I mean if we were to write rules around cottage licensing so it requires an inspection if you're yes unless you're exempt from a license okay. right so and in this case we would not be able to exempt people from a license because they're adding a regulated product to their food or right in their manufacturing so I thought, I thought it was just your the home based uh, like the cottage, uh, home-based caterer or home-based, uh, you know, baker or, or whatever was was an unlicensed position, and therefore did not. You had to uh, you had to follow the same regulations, but you were not going to be inspected. Well, the I thought that was the, like the under sixty-five hundred or under ten thousand was unlicensed. And did not require an inspection, but we're saying licensed and inspection. Yes. So according to their the flyer that's on the Department of Health website, it talks about the steps to getting a home-based food business license, mm -hmm. and it talks um, on the second page about the conditions under which you can be exempt from getting a license altogether, and that is what we talked about the last time was the kind of the sales limitations, mm -hmm. the dollar amounts that are included there. So the way I read this was, if you're doing this out of your home, you need to get a license unless it is under this, uh, I think it was 6,500 for certain products yeah. and 10,000 for other types of right. products. And then you, you couldn't be exempt. And um, also, I think if you were selling to certain establishments, so if you're selling at a farmer's market or something like that, you did not have to get a license and you're under that 10,000 or 6,500, but then if you're selling it to like a restaurant that you did, that's the way I read it. Right. But so are we thinking a cottage, we're thinking of a cottage manufacturing license because we don't want to have an unlicensed tier. Correct. But we are thinking about having those uh, sales caps though? So that's what I was thinking, yes. I was thinking we could say, um, you know, if it's under $10,000 in sales a year, mm -hmm. that it would be the, a, like a cottage level license, have a lower license tier, and um, allow people, adjust the rules to allow people to do it in their home. So we have certain rules that I think might make it difficult for people to do this as a home mm -hmm. uh, business. production, yeah, or home business. Do you have those, I don't need to put you on the spot, but do you have those specific sections of rule one and two that would prevent um, Yep, so the visitors, there was under the, I think it was under the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Do I remember the number? No, two it's all right. No, 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 just conceptually. <laughs> I'm just thinking conceptually is fine. You do it like yeah. friends titles. The ones yeah. about the visitors. <laughs> right, The yeah. ones about, um, Let's see, what was the other security. one? Security, and then which said that in order to be in your manufacturing facility, it had to be, um, you had to have a, the ID card, right? Mm -hmm. I think that was in that portion of the rules. And then the fire safety, I think we've said, and certainly correct me if I'm wrong, that fire safety would have to inspect every mm -hmm. manufacturer. And they don't typically inspect single right. family dwellings. And, and just to the visitor question, I think, Conceptually, visitors to an establishment is a, is a really cool concept. It helps unlock a lot of the mystery around how these products actually make it to market. But when you invite the public onto your 
premises, even if it's under home occupation, that's when fire safety gets involved to make sure that the public in your home occupation business um, is not at risk from a fire and public safety perspective. So, right, so we can't waive the fire and safety regulations. However, what Kyle said is, is true, which is their jurisdiction extends to public places of public accommodation. Uh, it doesn't extend to single family residences. So um, I, I'm really just trying to distinguish in my head what the difference between a tier two and a cottage will be. I understand the, the, the sales threshold. Um, and again, if, if this means that we're not gonna inspect, that's, um, that'd be a huge difference uh, to me. So I don't think that we would not inspect. I don't necessarily think though, if people are baking in their home kitchen that we need to have fire safety inspect. So if, we're, if, if that part of the rule would not extend, or maybe I'm misunderstanding, if that would not extend to somebody who's doing this in their, in their home, then that solves part of that. I mean, the reason why I presented it as like, here's the problem I see. We don't necessarily have to solve it with a different tier of licensing, but right. I think we do want to make opportunities for people to be able to incubate in their own homes if they have that opportunity, right. or to do it as like a side, uh, you know, business that maybe helps them go through school or do something else. You know, they may not do cannabis for their whole life, but it may also grow into a business that they then have a manufacturing facility. Yeah. yeah, I can respect and appreciate how generally speaking people are looking for multiple streams yeah. of income these days. And so this license type might make sense for somebody who is looking for something supplemental to what their otherwise day job might take a, a majority of their time. And, and I appreciate that, of course. And I, I just think that's what the tier two license does. Um, you know. If, I really, you know, when I was looking through, I was coming around to the idea, I'm just trying to figure out exactly what we're waiving for a tier, between the difference between a tier two and a cottage. Or, I mean, are we gonna waive the inspection requirement? Um, are, are we just gonna say that people that are operating under their home, in their homes, we want them to follow, you know, all of the kind of Department of Health safety uh, regulations um, that apply to these at home, you know, the, bakers and uh, food manufacturers, but that we're not going to inspect. I mean, that to me would be a, a big difference that would help the board, certainly, you know, it would, it would decrease the burden on our on the board. Um, and we have faith in our small bakers already, um, our small food manufacturers, because they're exempt from the inspection requirement. Um, so that would be one you know, major difference from a resource perspective mm -hmm. for the board. If we had this cottage license and, you know, you were going to keep your sales small, the impact, you know, the potential impact for selling a contaminated product or, or whatever the risk is would be very minimal because you're keeping your sales low. Um, so, you know, if, if the idea is that it's less of a regulatory burden on that person and for us, then, um, then I can see why we might, that it would be a good idea. Otherwise, I'm trying to really just dig into what the difference is between a, a tier two and a. So, so I think we could do it with that. I mean, like you're right about the, the exemption is that they don't have to be inspected. So I, I, I can agree with that. I think we might want to add them to some like random inspections in the future or add, you know, ensure that they've been through some health and safety training, which I think is pretty easy to find right. elsewhere, um, just so that people understand how to how to keep their kitchen clean if they're producing at home. Yeah, um, yeah that and I think um, the break-even point with the license uh, fees that we have for uh, tier two manufacturing are high for someone who's doing low production, small batch production. In terms of if you know when you when you get, and I only did it back of the napkin like how many how many brownies how many cookies yeah. would you have to make um, if if you have anywhere between a thousand and twenty five hundred dollars as a license fee that break even point is much much higher than I think people would be interested in I I think it would be a deterrent. Okay. Do you have a fee that you've thought about? I was thinking like two hundred dollars, really low. 
But I got <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you have a sales threshold for this? Yeah, I was thinking the $10,000. 10000 okay. And that's actually, I think, for cannabis products, a pretty low threshold. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if we had 80 people who sought this license, it would only be like 10% of the, like for edibles, because it's just to make it easy, I looked at one thing. Um, of what we've projected in sales for those. So have you, have you thought about what else from the application standpoint that we'd be waiving? Because that's where I thought that there was a pretty high burden. And I know that we've been looking at trying to reduce kind of some of the requirements in rule one on the application side. But uh, to me, that's where really, you know, someone who's really trying to be kind of an at-home small baker, having to put together um, the kind of, all the plans that we're requiring in the application might be, might be too burdensome. Yeah. Um, so I didn't think all the way through that. Um, but I, yes, I agree. Like I'm thinking about, you know, what kind of business plan would we ask someone like, who's seeking a license like that to submit it, it would be much more skeletal than what we're asking for larger operations, I think. So, yeah, I think there's lots of room for exemption there. And of course the major costs are around, I think, testing and labeling, um, packaging generally. Are you thinking about waiving any of, any of those requirements? No, you can buy packages on Amazon and you can have the labels printed at Staples. It's and it's not. I mean, there are, you can buy a hundred packages that have the ASTM, even though we haven't required that um, certification for forty or fifty dollars. And the testing. So the testing would depend on what it is we're, what it is someone is making. So I think we could still do the testing. I don't think we're going to have to waive the testing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I wasn't clear on what, and I, maybe we haven't decided on this, but like for things that are produced, what is the size of a batch? So if somebody's making a batch of something at home, like what is the size of that batch that has to be produced? Yeah. Tested, sorry. Yeah, I mean, there's pretty strict, uh, you know, edible, especially around edibles, right. pretty strict right, rule, statutory rules about what's allowed on the edible side. So the, the testing would have to really, it's hard to waive any of that, honestly. Right, but I'm not sure, depending on the size of a batch, so if someone makes a batch of 100 and that's, they do a sampling of that batch, then isn't the testing, I feel like it was like somewhere around 70 or $80 for cannabinoids, right? Wouldn't necessarily be the full panel, which was like $500 mm -hmm. average, right? Mm -hmm. It would just be some of those things. Mm -hmm. Like they wouldn't be testing edibles for molds and things like that. It would, that product would probably be tested before it goes into the cannabis or into the edible. Okay. All right. Um, I think we can draw some lines in the sand that uh, afford people some flexibility. But the general gist is there would be a sales threshold, roughly. $10,000. That $10,000 number shows up in a lot of different agencies when you trigger more regulatory right. burdens too, yeah. even at the Agency of Agriculture and stuff like that. So I don't think folks would be all too unfamiliar with that threshold. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, inspections would be less. We don't know yet. Right. But it would be, they would be less than a tier two manufacturer. Maybe, you know, you're gonna get inspected maybe once every five years, but it's gonna be random, so you don't know when that's gonna be, something along those lines. Like we inspect 20% mm -hmm. of these mm -hmm. licensees a year, um, something, you know. Yeah. And I mean, we would notice people, I think, before we should take off. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have some form of a short form application that wouldn't look like a tier two manufacturing application. Um, but we're not going to be waiving any sort of testing or labeling requirements. Okay. All right. I mean, it, it seems fine to me. I don't know if the $200 is right or not. Um, you know, it really depends to me. Those fees really depend upon what sort of 
regulatory burden it places on the board. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I don't know if 200 is the right number or not. It could certainly be a placeholder for now. Um, but yeah, I think I'm okay with the concept. Okay. Likewise. And so I want to raise another potential new license type. Okay. Um, on, on a similar vein with a slightly different twist. And what, I, what I'm thinking, I'm thinking about it, I'm going to call it the incubator indoor license type. And I want, I'm thinking about it that way conceptually. We don't need to stick with it. It's similar to the cottage thought, but from my perspective, you know, um, you know, one, I think we've heard from a lot of folks that the thousand square foot canopy is too small. We've also heard from some folks that it's too big. Um, they, at this point in time, are not ready for that, or they don't necessarily want to, given the way that they currently operate and everything else they've got going on in their life, want, want to be treated the same as a thousand square foot grower. And I think, you know, this is really interesting because typically business moves a lot faster than, than government. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's kind of the inverse. I recognize that this, the forming and the standing up of this industry is moving a lot faster than some folks are ready for in a business context. And so just, just trying to recognize that and recognizing that we do have very strong home occupation, you know, a robust home occupation market in this state, I don't think necessarily anything in either of our authorizing statutes would prevent somebody from from growing in a residential zoned area, but there's still a lot of regulatory burden that could make that an expensive high barrier to entry. Notably, stuff we've already mentioned in this context, security, visitors, and so on and so forth. So with this incubator license, what, I, what I'm proposing is a license type where you can grow 25 plants under home occupation. And what I would like to see is your ability to seek this license sunset after a set period of time. Maybe you're, and, and I think that recognizes that certain folks don't have the time, the energy, the connections, the wherewithal, generally speaking, to move from maybe growing home grow right now to over 100 plants. There's an educational curve that I think we hear a lot of people are ready for. Some people might not be ready for that, whether it's, translating those skills of growing a handful of plants to a high number of plants, or you know, this is their second, third side hustle, and it's not their primary means of, of business, even at a thousand square foot, that might be hard to be your primary source of income. So I think if we can, I think, you know, one of the things that I would wanna see a part of this, this license type, maybe stronger than other license types is, your business plan. What are your what are your goals? How are you going to get beyond this very small license type into one of our more defined culti indoor cultivation license types? So in my mind, the way I see this working is let's say a low barrier to entry. You can more cleanly fit in current home occupation rules. And I've looked at various municipalities and how they treat home occupation, and this seems like something that could me more easily fit into certain things, even from a a growing perspective. Let's say you want a thousand square foot canopy and you want to do it in your garage. There's something that says you can't, but you might need to update your circuit breakers. You might need to do certain things to get those grow lights from a public fire safety perspective up and running. I think if we limit that number and allow folks to, over the course of maybe two years or a couple more, seek this license and help them grow into one of our cultivation tiers, we might capture more of the legacy market that are currently doing this. They just don't have the wherewithal because we're moving fast to get their ducks in a row ahead of when license is open. I think, you know, one of the feedback that I've read around the country when it comes to cottage licenses is you often produce so little in the grand scheme of things that certain wholesalers or other folks along the supply chain won't look at you not seriously, but you don't have the, the quantity that they want in a business relationship. But I think the, the size of the market that we're operating on and the, what I expect to be strong co-op structure of, uh, of how this market's going to take place, I think it will help those small micro growers really find and make connections and, and still be able to offload these products and make you know, supplemental income in addition to what their day job is. But I think it's, it's just recognizing that um, 
even that thousand square foot might not be appropriate for folks, you know, given their set of circumstances. But I still would want to see a plan to get into a thousand, twenty five hundred, or five thousand, or whatever the case may be, as you try and figure out if this is what you want to do with your life full time. So, is the problem that we're facing that the seven hundred fifty dollar recommended fee is too high? No, I'm thinking. I'm not even necessarily thinking from a fee perspective. I just think if it, folks folks want to do this because they're currently doing it in their home or their garage or wherever the case may be. And I think again, there's nothing that says you can't grow in a residentially zoned area. But I think some some things that we have done or other local zoning issues might just make that a high burden. And so I was thinking maybe $500 for this fee. You, and it's the, the intention is to getting used to being regulated. You know, a lot of folks are good at what they do in a four by eight little pop-up tent in their attic or their garage or basement or bedroom, whatever. But I think that they are not used to the high level of requirements from a regulated market that we would ask of certain businesses, whether it's updating energy. I mean, in home occupation, you still need to take care of storm and wastewater. So that would still be present. And I think just with an understanding that this is a limited license, not, not that it's limited to everybody, meaning that the license will go away in two years generally, but me myself could not operate it more than a couple years and we can figure out if there's a, a right number for that. But I think, you know, with, with this kind of micro license or incubator license, we can, you know, bring in a lot more folks that otherwise might think that even the thousand square foot and those requirements, no matter how many accommodations we can make, might just be unrealistic because it's going to be so hard to do it in their home. They might still need to seek commercial, uh, commercial business or real estate to do so. I like the point that you mentioned about learning, like understanding what it means to be regulated, because it seems like if you're doing this in a space that's already existing in your home, you're learning to be regulated without investing a lot of personal funds, potentially with a huge amount of risk. So it could, I agree, I think it could encourage people to come into the market that may otherwise not. Yeah, and not. I agree. And I don't want to undercut the small cultivator license, and that's why I think you know, five hundred dollars for this, seven fifty for small cultivators in two years. That two fifty, if if you're where we hope you are, that should not be a barrier to entry. But I, I still think whether it's visitors, whether it's security requirements, I mean, we can put certain parameters on this where there is no visitors, so we can fit it very cleanly into home occupation. And I think municipalities are very um, educated when it comes to the home occupation standards and how that's different from a home business where you're inviting folks in from a retail perspective. Um, I, I think it would be a clean option for folks that otherwise feel like, you know, even the accommodations that we can make per statute just might not be enough to get them interested. I'm having just a difficult time really distinguishing once again, and I'm sorry if I'm being obtuse here, the difference between this and a small cultivator, because we can't waive energy and environmental regulations, right? We can lower the bar across the board, but we can't waive those for this, for this license type. Um, no one has to, no one ha is required to either build a thousand square feet or allow visitors into their house. So that you know they don't necessarily have to you know have fire safety or whoever come inspect their house if they're not going to allow visitors. So I'm just trying to really drill down on what is the difference here between this and a small cultivator. Uh, again, I, and you know I wish I had all the answers. <laughs> I don't because I haven't you know we I have I as Julie kind of alluded to I have to go back and look at very specific requirements. I think. Generally speaking, when you're using less energy and you're growing less plants, like even in, if you wanted to grow the thousand square foot, and I get you don't have to grow up to that. I think I've just heard from some folks that they want to do it on a more micro level and don't want to be included in that license type. And I can appreciate that. That's not my sole reasoning for doing this, but you might need to make, you know, upgrades to your residential structure or building to still meet certain requirements of a thousand square foot grow that you otherwise would not need to make 
under a more micro grow. And so that might de incentivize some folks from growing, you know, a thousand up to a thousand square feet, where I think and a lot of it comes down to cost. You know, I know that there's grants and programs out there. We've talked about them at, you know, at an exhaustive rate that Efficiency Vermont might help you do so by grow by buying the actual lights. But what does that mean from actually updating the structure of your of your residential dwelling in order to meet certain standards that you otherwise would have to do? From the visitor perspective, you know, I don't know if we can include. It's a point well taken. I don't know if we can include on the application that you opt yourself out of visitors yeah. that might otherwise allow you to avoid some fire safety stuff but as it's written you know you're allowed to do it i mean you're allowed to have visitors in is that is that a blanket no matter what or are we being allowing folks to kind of subject themselves to that regulatory oversight or not i don't know i think at the end of the day my intention is just recognizing that some folks are not ready for the type of financial commitment it takes to grow a thousand square foot license. Some folks in the illicit market are not gonna seek that license no matter how many accommodations we make. But isn't creating this license type just another accommodation? I mean, I just don't understand the difference. I mean, we're essentially said 500 square, you know, thousand square feet is a, it's a ceiling, it's not a floor, I, you know, people can grow anything they want within that thousand square feet and we can make any accommodation we want other than energy and environmental uh, to those so i don't I just don't see why we wouldn't be focused instead of creating a new license type focused on creating exemptions for small cultivators i i, I get that and I, I think i'm just bringing this is bringing the license type is trying to shed some light on some of the still issues that i'm i guess at least hearing about and so i was trying to find an equal medium here i just think that if, if we can find a cleaner glide path from a permitting and regulatory perspective to give clarity that some folks under the right set of circumstances can participate in the regulated market by growing it in their residential dwelling, there might be more appetite from otherwise folks who, one, we've got a lot of education and guidance to put out, two, tell folks what they can and cannot do, but it's, it's, it's something that one, municipalities are familiar with, and two, I just think We'll get more buy-in from this more limited license type right now that allows you to kind of grow into being regulated at at the higher tiers did you say a plant limit or a plant 25 limit? plants and what's the rough square foot equivalent to that um i think it depends on your i think it would depend on your growing methodology and the type of plants that you're growing and is that 25 plants are those female flowering plants or is that total total I'm trying to find a equal medium between home growing, recognizing that some folks are growing more than they're legally allowed to grow, home growing, and, and, and I get, you don't have to grow a thousand square feet. I totally appreciate every point that you're bringing forward. I just think that some, we, we'll get more buy-in from some folks if we find a, you know, equal medium between home growing and the thousand square foot canopy. I mean, it seems like Yes, you don't have to grow a thousand square feet as a small cultivator, but you would need to in order to have the, the cost, in order to benefit from the various different costs that you have to invest in. So if there's some way that we can allow access, or make an accommodation in some way to allow people who are growing less than that to grow a business, that seems like a way to provide a, a glide path, like you said, for people who are in the legacy market now to come into the regulated market. Uh, yeah, and I'm and not even if it's just testing it out. Like people may do this for a couple of years and decide, actually, this is not for me. I'm just going to grow for myself. You know, like that might be the, or I'm going to sell my business, and that would be, you know, a, a benefit to them. So, uh, I just, I just keep coming back to the point of so there's other regulatory compliance costs that we're talking about that would that the thousand square foot may, may be a barrier to entry. Why aren't we just cutting those? Why aren't, why aren't we looking at what those regulatory burdens are and saying, okay, we don't need a security plan in your application period. We don't need a business operations plan. We don't need X, Y, or Z for the thousand square footers. So I, like, I don't see why we're creating a new license type. I mean, it seems to me like we're getting to the point where we're slicing this up so much instead of trying to really focus on 
what our legislative charge is, which is to waive accommodations for small cultivators. <clears throat> and again, we can't waive energy and environmental ones. I think a lot of the things that you're talking about, as far as upgrading your house and things like that, are the energy and environmental concerns that, we're, that we either have to lower for the entire industry or we need to, um, we need, you know, we can't just create a new license site and say none of those things apply. Is there a point at which, um, let me figure out how to say this, is there a point at which within that, you know, zero to a thousand square feet that it's true we don't need all of these items, you know, the business plan and so forth, but that then it turns to we do and you know is it if you have and I'm not this is I'm not the words are coming out of my mouth as I'm thinking and that's not working out for me <laughs> but um well, yeah, like I, if it's zero to 500 maybe you're following me but like if it's zero to 500 square feet maybe the risk is so low and I'd be so few licenses that we don't need all those things and maybe the energy impact is already small because it's such a small grow but then from a certain point up to a thousand square feet, it is necessary because it does trigger all these other important things like energy and environmental standards. I think, I think if I'm following Julie, she's she's raising that you know if we every thousand square foot application that we get, are we going to look through it so substantively that we know exactly what you're doing and making certain accommodations for individuals over a certain threshold if you're planning to do certain things, or is it easier? to propose a new license type, recognizing that your impact is so small. I understand that we can't make many accommodations, if at all, for environmental and energy purposes. But to what extent will the 1,000 square foot, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting lost in my own words now, too, but I think I know. <laughs> I, think I, know. I think I know what you're saying. It's like, do we treat everybody equally, even if they are planning to grow under that 1,000 square foot cap? recognizing that this is where the most discretion that we have as a board is versus making an even smaller license type that limits people. And again, like, I think that they would enjoy most, if not all, the same benefits of small cultivators. Maybe we do need to just look more closely on at the final rulemaking stage on security plans, on um, visitors and, and the sort. But my overall intent was some folks just potentially aren't aren't ready and we're getting a lot of questions about residential real estate commercial real estate agricultural real estate so on and so forth and a lot of that is a lot of that is that we need to address through through guidance but i think there is there are folks that want to grow this at their home with a very low barrier to entry and so my my thought in trying to solve a lot of those issues was to just make an incubator license type where you can be on it for a couple years but we want to see you grow into a, a more robust license type. I think it would be, from a sequencing point of view, it would be very beneficial for us to go through rule one and two again and look at what we want to waive for small cultivators before we create a new license type. I just, to me, that, that should be the kind of starting point. And if we say, okay, well, this is still too expensive for certain people, you know, certain people that are currently growing in the illicit market, then we should think about creating an even, I mean, a thousand square feet is very much considered a micro license, would be considered a super micro license anywhere else. I, you know, I just, I feel like we should do what we need to do, which is waive the regulations that allow the, to the, reduce these barriers to entry before we further slice the small cultivator license. And I don't even know really how we make further accommodations for them. I mean, we can't just say, you're allowed to do this in your home because this is a commercial product and you know until that gets changed if it does get changed um you know a town could still say no you can't do this in your home you know it, it, we can't just impose our judgment you know we can't just say this is a home business well, i don't want to get into semantics about the authorizing legislation but it does not technically say it's a commercial product it just says it's not an agricultural product right. but i'm just saying that just because we say something doesn't mean that the towns have to accept that, is my only point there. I thought that the towns didn't have as much control over home occupation as they do home business. Well, why don't we say small cultivators are home occupation? You know, I'm just saying well, that. Maybe that is the way around it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I think that we should really be focused on what our primary task is, which is to think about small cultivators as the legacy market and try and make accommodations to them. 
as opposed to bringing in um, a whole new license type that we don't even really, I don't fully understand what what it is that we're waiving for, for this incubator program that we're not gonna be waiving for small cultivators. I think we should do that work first before we propose a new license. Fair type. enough, I just, I think, I think, you know, as we talk about home occupation and small cultivators, I think, I think it's I think it's going to be challenged no matter how many accommodations we make to, you know, do that cleanly at the at the square footage we're talking about. But that doesn't make it impossible. I just thought. And do you want to do the same? I guess my question is, do you want to have the same level of accommodations for someone who's growing exactly a thousand square feet, utilizing the whole license type? or who has maybe eight plants or 10 plants? Do we want to make the same level of accommodation? I mean, that's what we've been told to do. Right. Is well, treat them equally, you know, and treat them, you know, inspect them, test, make sure that they're being tested, that we know where these plants are and where the product is moving, make sure it's not being diverted. Um, you, know, it, you know, the whole kind of, backbone of the rationale means that we have to treat, you know, someone who's growing any, who's putting any of this into the stream of commerce the same, um, but we can make accommodations for small cultivators. Yeah, and I guess, you know, one of my thoughts here was like, you know, I recognize I'm trying to meet people where they're at right now, which is growing it at home in some way, shape or form or on their property. I'd like to see folks move up and grow their businesses. So how did, how could, we meet certain folks where they're at, recognizing that they probably want to get to a different point, just like we hope that they do, and just try to make as many accommodations from that perspective. You know, do I want all small cultivators taking advantage of home occupation? At the beginning, yes, but I want to see growth. So this was an, oh, an opportunity, I thought, to allow the folks that just don't have the however many different means there are, <laughs> which there's a lot, to trying to be a regulated entity in this market. You know, some folks are pursuing new real estate, some folks are trying to figure out how to do it at home, but it, was there a way that we could just meet everybody where they're at? And, you know, does that warrant a special license type? I don't know, I thought I'd bring it forward for discussion. Um, I, I wonder if we'll get some public comment on it, actually. It, yeah, maybe I'm off, you know, I've talked to some folks that thought we'd capture a lot more interest with this new license type. Um, but I have been wrong before and I'll be wrong again, you know? <laughs> I'm not saying that that's, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I, what, I want, what I want to be very clear about is what we're waiving for these folks that makes it so much less of a burden that we wouldn't be comfortable waiving for a thousand square foot. So I think what we should do is have a meeting, at a meeting, uh, maybe soon, sooner rather than later, is once again go through rules one and two and say, I'd feel comfortable waiving that for all small cultivators. I'd only feel comfortable waiving this for people in this incubator style. And if there is a very clear difference between those two, then I think it's a good idea to have this license thing. Yeah, and I mean, for the record, they would still need to have their products tested, so right. on and so forth. I just think it was an interesting opportunity to recognize that it with even in the small cultivator category, like I've heard from so many different folks that are interested at so many different starting points. And how do we try and accommodate recognizing that the legislative intent is, you know, prioritizing small cultivators, but also moving as much of the illicit market into the regulated market as we can. And, and I guarantee there's going to be some folks that aren't going to want to grow that much regardless of, of what we accommodate for them, at least right now. Can, can you say that again, not want to grow up to a thousand square feet? Yeah, I bet you there will be folks and you know, I'm, I get and appreciate that. I'm still referring to this as an incubator program where I'd want to see marginal growth over the first two years to graduate. Or I'm saying two years, that's a number in my head. It doesn't have to be that number. I, I want to make that very clear, but how can we help you scale up to making this more of a priority in your in your life you know granted that it takes a lot of time attention detail and understanding of this plant to, to grow any of any number of them <laughs> let alone you know the jump from a home grow to a thousand square foot space and there's some folks that are interested and it's their side gig or their their hobby that might 
want to figure out ways to, you know, make it a little bit more part of their, their portfolio moving forward. So the problem really that we anticipate is that there are people who have very small grows, far less than a thousand square feet, that we still want to come into the regulated market. Yeah, and do they warrant special attention? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I know what the legislation says. I, we may we may actually need to think a little smaller, even given just the structure of our state. It, it's and it's. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that work. The the, the thing that I want to know uh, on this is, I mean, we still have to. We still have some mandate for seed to sale trade. We need to make sure that a legally grown plant doesn't end up on a gray or illicit market. And so, what does that mean for this? group of folks and what happens if their businesses fail and they all of a sudden have 25 flowering plants you know are we in charge of that you know if we gave gave someone a license then it's our responsibility to deal with that and to make sure it's not getting diverted so you know i just i would like to go through our rule one and two and just again kind of divide things into three categories mandatory for everyone waivable for the thousand square foot and then you know if there's a if we see that you know this might be a good idea for a thousand square foot grow, but not necessary for a home occupancy incubator grow, and it's, it's, the more that we find that fit into that third bucket, the more to me it's a good idea to have that. Yeah, no, I appreciate. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'd, I'd like to have us all do that just to to see if it, this rises to the level of necessity. I think. To your point, we're going to have people fail at every single level, and we're going to have to figure out from a compliance and enforcement perspective what we do with grows that do fail. It's inevitable in market dynamics that some people win, some people lose. Um, yeah, but for the record, these folks, I would still require that they be in inventory tracking, and they would have their product tested. To me, it was more about learning how to be regulated, crafting relationships that you might otherwise not have right now to f help yourself become part of a co-op or relationships with wholesalers or retailers or, you know, it, it's, it's just think, trying, again, trying to meet people where they're currently at with goals to move forward. Yeah. I just, when I envision that, I just envision it for all the small thousands, cultivators. All small cultivators. You know, to me, that's the kind of introductory license no one's telling you you have to grow a thousand square feet you know it, 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 that's the kind of that that category to me should be the bare minimum requirements you know that should be capturing these same folks i just i get that i was again if i think about home occupation i think we should view the small cultivator exemptions as you're talking about can somebody do this in their home without additional regulatory burden and there's some decisions that we would have to make, I think, especially on visitors. I want folks to be able to visit certain operations to see, oh, this is how this is done, you know, and unlock the mystery. But then you open yourself up to it being a public space and fire safety would have to come and approve your operation. So there's just decisions on what we think would have to make. This would kind of cut that conversation short by not allowing certain things and allowing you to do it in the comforts of your home and craft those relationships and grow your business at your pace over the course of a couple years before you would no longer be able to seek this license. But we don't have to keep recycling the same talking points, or at least I don't. But if, if we are going to do that exercise, we would have to do the, that you suggested, looking at sort of, we need to do that this week, right? If we're going to consider this as one of the license types that we suggest. We'd have to do it before a few bill passes. Doesn't necessarily have to be this today. week. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, food for thought. Yeah. Um, any other license types that we should talk about during this portion? Are we going to talk about event and again? Um, I think we should. Yeah. I mean, they're both. They are contained in both our January fifteenth report and our NACB social equity report. So we can talk about them then, or we can talk about them now. Let's talk about it now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> just so uh, we're all clear, I was planning on moving to NACB next, okay. um, and then after we're done with this conversation, and then maybe take a break depending on the time, and do the January fifteenth final review um, after after that. So, um, but no, why don't we go ahead? Uh, I think t delivery. I think we all kind of came to a mm -hmm. conclusion on, so I don't think we have to rehash that. Um, but on-site consumption, temporary event. 
So I, I was thinking about on-site on consumption after our last meeting and event, and what I what stuck out in my mind was the event licensing um, having a requirement for transportation, um, like an approved transportation plan, and I wonder if if we could still include on-site consumption in our January 15th report as a possible license type if the on-site consumption is somewhere where public transportation is available. I see the sort of approved transportation plan and the access to public transportation is sort of meeting the same goal, right? Is that people are not driving after consuming. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think really, to me, you just need to have some, whether it's on-site consumption or, you know, if you're seeking a permanent on-site consumption location, there needs to be a public safety plan involved. And it doesn't have to be accessible by public transportation. That would be a huge benefit if it was. It knocks out, you know, what three quarters of the state, though. It does, yeah. Um, so to me, you know, you could have, you could have people that work for you that are willing to drive customers in their cars back home. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be public transportation. So I don't know, you know, I'm, I, I'm in a fan of on-site consumption, recognizing the highway safety issues present a real challenge to, to just our general mission of creating a safe market. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't, I just don't feel like we need to be prescriptive that it has to be accessible by public transportation. I think any on-site consumption needs, application needs to have a very detailed highway safety plan. And it doesn't have to be specifically detailed. It just needs to actually work. It needs to pass the straight mm -hmm. face test that there's a plan to get these folks home safely. Anyone who's consumed. It seems like in our last meeting, though, we were not going to recommend on-site consumption as a... Are we talking about on-site consumption, like consumption lounges, or on-site consumption in the context of special permits? Because it looked like we were in the context of a special, special event, permit event with an on-site designated area versus what we hear about a lot, which is a brick-and-mortar consumption lounge. I'm talking about the latter. The lounge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I mean... I'm in favor of it. I, I just recognize that we might need to kind of back into it. You know, I, I think that we might need to have some, some model that we can point to that says that this can work, um, that, that, this, that this can achieve uh, kind of safety goals that we've all laid out. Um, can I ask you a question? I'm going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it in front of me, but on our labeling requirements, What's the time limit that says you shouldn't operate? Isn't there like a two hour time limit? I um, want to say it was two it or says four. Something two like hours it, is for edibles. Then. Right, okay. it says yeah. like edibles could take, could take up to two hours and then it just says uh, something to the effect of like, it, this can impact your, impair you. Okay, I was trying to tie that. Like let's say yeah. you have a special event and your special event ends at 11 p.m. and you cut off on, on site consumption at nine. Just thinking out loud, but. Maybe so, that's not appropriate in this context. I don't know. I was yeah. trying to tie it to what we've, work we've already done and established as part of our program. So when we heard from the DRE program, they said, it's, they said technically 24 hours is the best, but obviously that's not realistic. Sure. Um, you know, people have to go to work the next day. So I think the, the recommendation was 6 to 12 hours, you know, not operate a motor vehicle for 6 to 12 hours post-consumption. But that you know, might not be realistic either. Yeah, I mean, I want folks to give us their plan. The problem is then it becomes so subjective that it's hard for folks to understand what's a potentially what is a successful right, and plan and what is not a plan, and that that gives us the ability to look at that. But at the same time, I suppose we would decide in, in rule what that plan would what the what it would have to look like, right? What the criteria would be for that plan. I wouldn't want to be in a situation where we're just approving you know, haphazardly. Like this one looks good and this one looks good, but maybe not this one. Right. We'd have to have criteria, right? So for event licenses, a retailer then potentially could apply for an event license, right? And have an avenue to on site consumption in their retail space potentially or however that except for the prohibition on that. 
we do, we do prohibit that elsewhere. The on-site consumption at a licensed brick and mortar retail cannabis establishment. Yeah, but if that was changed at the legislative level, I think not that well. It's part of the special event license type. We might be able to. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud. I'm thinking back to what you said about the path to on-site consumption. And if we were able to change that and allow retailers to apply for event licenses, we could demonstrate that it's safe, then that might be the path to on-site consumption. That, that's how I see it. Yeah. Um, you know, New York's doing it. You know, they probably won't come online anytime soon. You know, these licenses likely won't be issued anytime soon. Um, you know, or it's a little bit of putting our head in the sands by not recognizing that these things exist in Washington, D.C., they exist in San Francisco, they exist in Spain. You know, on-site consumption is not, you know, a totally foreign concept uh, to the cannabis industry. Um, I just, I think about the, the hurdle to getting us there uh, in a state that has public transportation challenges. Um, and it seems like we need to have some demonstrated success. Then again, you know, if we all think it's a good idea, then we can leave the details to someone else to figure out. We can recommend it and just say, uh, we think it's a good idea for these reasons, and we'll figure it out. If, we, if you want us to figure it out, we will. If the legislature wants to put guardrails around it, they can. I mean, ultimately, whatever we decide, needs legislative That's materials, right. so right. it doesn't really, um, it's not a huge problem for us to recommend it, but the follow-up question is just, what does it look like? Yeah, and in New York, they've written social consumption into their their regulations, but mm -hmm. right now, you can consume, if I understand this right, well, anywhere that you, yeah, anywhere you can, can smoke, smoke a cigarette. cigarette. Yeah. So, maybe the way to solve the consumption problem or the you know the equity problem with consumption is to recommend that yeah. to the legislature yeah i, mean, I think there'd be fewer questions sorry to interrupt but there'd be fewer questions like if you allow consumption like that then we don't we've already had the public health conversation about secondhand smoke we've already said as a state where people can smoke a cigarette already so that conversation's already been had. Versus, I think the conversations that we'll have with on-site and event consumption that like, is it indoors? What happens with the ventilated space? Like, I think if we open it up, we could still have event licenses so people could retail and sell and manufacture or whatever at, a, at an event. But if you could just consume it where you can smoke a cigarette, that seems to solve most of the problem. Yeah, I mean, this is the conundrum that I've been trying to untangle, which is that it's we have we are inevitably going to have a very large tourist contingency purchasing here in Vermont, and yet these tourists have nowhere to consume in Vermont. They can't go into a car. They can't go into uh, you know most Airbnbs have a line in there about not consuming. Um, certainly, if you're in federally subsidized housing, you're not allowed to consume. Um, and even if you're at a ski resort that's on federally designated land, which a lot of them are, except for Kellington, maybe Jay, it's so, technically still consuming yeah, it in a federal a part of spot. that is state land, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was my justification in my head for on-site consumption. Uh, but maybe the, the real solution here is just to say what New York did, which is anywhere you can smoke a cigarette, you can consume cannabis. You know, you know, the controversy is, is that you're not preventing kind of youth from seeing that happening. Um, you know, that's the, the counter argument. And this is in a lot of ways normalizing cannabis use in a way that, um, you know, a lot of our prevention folks and our public health folks want to kind of have a non-normalization of cannabis use. Um, but, you know, it still doesn't, Solve, it, you know, it still doesn't. That mentality doesn't solve the problem that no, there's no legal place to consume. And as a secondary point, that there's 
disproportionate, disparate arrest rates, sentencing rates. Um, um, you know, there's a different response uh, to enforcement um, for people of color, and so they are going to continue to bear the burden or the brunt of the enforcement action um, for people that are consuming publicly. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, maybe it makes sense uh, to either say on-site consumption for these reasons or um, allowing people to consume openly. You know, there needs to be some solution here. How do you feel about this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of lost in which one we're, we're which one's rising to the top right now. I think it's an either or, right? It could be or both. both. Yeah. yeah. It could be both. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think as part of a designated area as part of a special event is obviously something that I'd like to see as part of our pilot program. I want to talk about that in a different context, but I don't want to muddy our conversation, so I'll get to that after we kind of settle here. As far as brick and mortar consumption, I think that's what we're yeah. talking about. Sorry, just a lot going on. <laughs> um, I want to see that happen, too. I don't know the easiest way for us to get there at this point in time you know whether it's any in any place that you can consume tobacco products or you know limiting it to a brick and mortar establishment I, I tend to think that considering everything we might get more traction with lounges than you can consume anywhere just at this point in time um, but that's my gut feeling yeah I think that's a fair point Okay, um, and just to be clear, my issue with indoor on-site consumption, and I know we had a comment about it last week, uh, the health concerns that I'm worried about are not the impairing effects of secondhand smoke, it's really the, the negative health consequences of inhaling particulate matter on a consistent basis if you're an employee that works at a consumption lounge, yeah. required to go into a spot that has smoke in it every single day. You're talking about carcinogens in general, not Carc the psychoactive effect of. I'm not saying on the psychoactive. I'm to, I'm strictly talking about the particular matter. Yeah. You know, not even just the carcinogens, yeah. just the strictly having to inhale smoke uh, if you're asthmatic or whatever else is is can have long term consequences. Yeah, and I don't know off the top of my head how other jurisdictions that have wandered in, into social consumption regulations have have handled that. Yeah, honestly. Well, that's one more thing we have to figure out. Yeah. I'm willing to <laughs> figure it out if it's something yeah. that we want to do, and I think. I mean, you can have single stalls, and you can have kind of these smoke eater machines that ventilate, and you know, it's not impossible to figure out, but uh, you, know, you can't subject employees to that on a daily basis. Respirators. I don't know. Um, all right, so. So the only other thing with special event licenses, and we heard from a, a number of our advisory committee members, and I mean, of course, we've heard from members of the public. I think if we are going to think long term about farm gate sales, these special events, I think allowing, suggesting to the legislature that we allow producers to sell their products at these special events is something that we should consider and I'd be in favor of. And I think, you know, it, it's a, it's kind of, as we talk about a pilot program, it really is a pilot program to understand how direct to consumer from a producer perspective will will you know be handled moving forward. And I think in the context of an application for a special event, if if that applicant does list the the potential participating producers, that gives us the ability to kind of look at their operation, make sure that they're from an inventory tracking perspective, you know, there's no irregularities or anything like that, they would still have to label and package their product in accordance with our rules. But I think in the spirit of those special events and their intended purpose, allowing producers or retailers to be present at those special events and setting up their own, you know, ability to sell there is something that um, I think would be a good first step if we do have the expectation and goal that at some point in the future, farm gate sales will be a part of our program. Any thoughts? 
I mean, I think that's how, I mean, I, I know, that's right? how alcohol sort of works now. Yeah, no, and we heard yeah. from, you know, we've heard from the public yeah. at length about this issue, and I yeah. think, you know, similar to your thoughts on social, or on consumption lounges, Pepper, like, I like the idea. How do we get there is, is really, yeah. you know, where I'm trying to figure things out with farm gate sales. But recognizing that this, this is a special event, not unlimited, and we would be able to kind of help on, in understanding who is participating, making sure that they have, you know, the wherewithal to follow our regulations. Um, it might be a good first step in acknowledging and understanding the expected and unexpected impacts of allowing producers to sell directly to consumers. That actually helps too with what I talked about in the last meeting was um, like the conventions that happen, you know, if, a, if that would help in that sort of business, building your business, having those conversations. If it's not just a retail, but. Because, I mean, it's point well taken. I mean, there is, I think, we heard it from Chris and from Savan in our last meeting. Like, Savan's like, yeah, you know, where you otherwise wouldn't be able to sell to the public. That's where businesses are able to grow their businesses. I think retailers would be a little different than your typical 802 Spirit store because, you know, the look and feel and, and the products that they're carrying are not, you know, the same as how we view a Vermont state run liquor store. I get that. But I think that there would be appetite for allowing both of them. Um, and I assume they'd still have to learn all of the pieces about like overconsumption and do all the training of somebody who is dispensing. Yeah, and I mean, I think that would be included in the special event, but I think, you know, this would be an opportunity for certain folks that feel like they have, you know, the ability to potentially, I know a lot of folks feel like they've got that ability right now, maybe they do, but you know, from a, the success of your business, in meeting our regulations in the spirit of our program. Understanding, you know, this would be a good starting point to learn. So, so are you thinking about this as a separate special event from a on-site consumption? I mean, that's what I think Eli was talking about in his comment last week, that this is, this would be distinct from a on-site consumption. It would be more like a farmer's market where producers can come together and sell their products and not consume on-site. Well, I, I've, and I don't have the definition of what we are putting forward in the January 15th report of a special event off the top of my head, but I think there would be room for both of those within the context of that pilot program because there is an event, if I remember correctly, that says an opportunity for these special events with a designated area for consumption. So I, I think of it as, and there it says retailers would be able to sell and there'd be a, a specific area for consumption. And I mean, I, I think if we just say producer or retailer, it doesn't change much. I think, you know, it, it could be that farmer's market for cannabis with a designated area, but it would still be a special event that would have to be vetted through the board and the local <coughs> scrutiny. So really, we just these are the myriad of things that we would allow under a special event license. Yeah, right? would be okay. It's obviously a lot easier to regulate if you don't allow on-site consumption; you just allow sales. I think we could do either or, but I think the special event, either or or both. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think if I'm remembering the language that we saw at the advisory committee last week, it says you can propose a designated area doesn't say you have to propose a designated area for on-site consumption. I'm saying it doesn't matter to me if you're a retailer or a producer setting up a vending area with a designated space for consumption if that's what you choose to do with your event. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, uh, I'm, the, the only reason that I'm, that I'm trying to work, this is the, my first time hearing about this. I'm trying to figure it out on the fly here. But what would prevent a cultivator from just holding one of these every single week at his or her farm? It would still be a special event that needs to get vetted through local. So I'm thinking about it in the context of, let's say there's an individual who wants to organize a special event and he or she has to 
you know, we've talked about you still need to have approval through your local municipality to host the event, and you've got to submit an application to us as a special event. All I'm saying is the vendors that would come for that special event to buy, because there is an on-site consumption option, but there's also a retail vending option, it was my understanding of our special event program. It wouldn't just be a special event to smoke or consume. It would be one where you could buy from retailers at that designated special event, kind of like a, a brew fest or something like that. Well, and we could decide that, what limitations there would be on the event. Yeah, that's what, everything would flow through us, is what I'm saying. So there wouldn't be the opportunity for somebody to hold one of these at their farm each week without our express approval and their local municipality approval of that. Yeah, but on what basis would we deny it if a, if a farmer said, I'm the only vendor it's at my farm, and every single weekend I want to do one of these special events. The same, the same basis we would have to deny anybody who wanted to do it with just retailers that wanted to, to seek a special event license to do anything. Well, that's why this was a pilot. You know, that's what because it was going to. You know, I was thinking in my mind it'd be very limited at first, so we can kind of see what the issues are, unintended consequences, etc. Yeah, no, but I think all I'm saying is we are saying that retailers can participate at this special event as it's currently drafted, but if we allow producers or retailers to participate at this event under the umbrella of the permit, meaning the event organizer who's going to submit the application on behalf of the event, allowing, you know, producer growing operations that otherwise might be interested in direct-to-farm sales, if we were to allow that, this would still be under our purview and it'd still be a special event and we would have scrutiny as a board to make sure that you know those special events we, we understand exactly who's vending but I'm just I'm just suggesting we not limit it just to the, the dispensaries or retail operations but allow folks that are growing I, I wasn't planning on that anyway I mean my vision of the special event license is that only a special event operator can put them on and that's what we license and then there's a event specific permit that you have to get as well but you know it's not only a retailer okay. can put on one of these events. Anyone can become a special event operator. But it's kind of like the bar that does weddings also. They are the ones in charge of getting all the liability insurance and having all the education and the um, overconsumption. And yeah, I was consumption. thinking about it differently. I was thinking about it, you know, in that, in that festival spirit because well, yeah, that's well, happening already. Well, so the, the festival spirit is kind of, I feel like we're combining the, these two concepts because, you know, at a wedding, you can't go to the cash bar and buy a six pack and take it home with you. You know, the alcohol stays on the premises. This is what you're saying, suggesting is more like a farmer's market where people are buying products and taking them home. Yeah, but to me, that's still, we could still regulate that as a special event under our pilot program. Right. I, I'm just, we're combining the on-site consumption Brewers Fest style event with a Farmer's Market style event. You know, brewer, Brewers Fest, you can't buy the beer and take it home with you. Um, you can consume on-site and then you leave with your cup. Um, <laughs> I have a million of them. <laughs> no, and I understand there is a disconnect in our definition and our understanding of what this would look like. I guess fundamentally, before I added this new wrinkle into it, I think that if we can find a way to include direct farm sales in our pilot program mm -hmm. to build that record, that you know we, we're going to say in our January fifteenth report, this should be a part of our program and can benefit all Vermonters moving forward. We're just not ready for it right now. We should find ways to start introducing it into what we're trying to accomplish from a regulatory perspective at the opportunities that are in front of us. Right. And so I think doing so in this context through the special event, and we can, again, if the legislature is so inclined to allow us to do it, we can put parameters around it and regulatory compliance around it. But I think, again, so your, your, your thought on these special events is let's say, XYZ dispensary, that's the brand that I just invented, could go and like hold a special event in a parking lot somewhere and well, sell outside the were a special event operator. Exactly. Okay. So we're, yeah. It's not, see, I, I want to decouple this from a brick and mortar retail licensee. They're not, in my mind, it, anyone can be a special event operator so long as you have the proper training and the proper insurance and the kind of 
have sought a special event license, uh, operator license. So that would even would that that would include a producer, for example, a producer or a cultivator. Could, uh, yes. So they could still. Right. So what I think what you're looking for is already available. Well, and then I think this is a little different than how we talked about it last week because I was under the understanding that we were talking about it that it would be retailers that could do special events. But I think I prefer that it's anyone, that anyone can do it. Yeah. Because then a, a producer can get a special event license, right? And have right. a special a producer event. producer could do it, yeah, and have a special event. The question is, is the special event limited to that date and time or in, with four on-site consumption at that event? Or is it a store, essentially? Is it, an, you know, is it a farmer's market where people are buying product and taking it home? Yeah, it seems like it would, well, it seems like you could do both, right? Well, uh, you know, I, my concerns around FinCEN guidance and point yeah. of sale and inventory tracking just hold. You know, the reason why we have so much regulation for our brick and mortar retailers is strictly because we need to know, you know, mm -hmm. that taxes are being paid, that uh, product is, you know, that, 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 that you know, Inventory matches receipts. Um, you know, the, it's it's not an insurmountable problem for direct consumer, but it's the same issues that I raised last week about why we might want to not do direct consumer in year one. Is we're trying to figure out how to ensure that we're tr we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is ensuring that you know we're compliant with federal guidance on this. Oh, well, I guess I think about special event a little bit more broadly than, than you do, and that's fine. I think it could be a producer or a retailer doing their own event. I get the, the nuance there. Are we allowing to consume or to purchase? I think if we allow to consume without purchasing, there's still going to be purchasing going on regardless of whether or not we say that there can be. At least, you know, and, and then that hurts them if they try and go for another special event. I get that. You could purchase to consume on site. I mean, that's you know. Right, but then we're going to run into the same. Take, take we're going to run into the same issues we get. Yeah, no. Well, I still think the special event context of having multiple vendors, whether they're retailers or the producers, still be subject to a lot of the other, whether it's inventory tracking or labeling or packaging requirements. I still think it's an opportunity for us to understand the intended and unintended impacts of allowing direct farm consumers in this pilot program context. And again, like this wouldn't be something that can happen every Saturday morning, like farmers markets can, it would still be considered a special event. And we would be list we would understand who would be selling at these special events, all under the umbrella of the applicant or the event organizer. I think you'd have to allow both purchase and consumption. I think if people are going to purchase it at a special event, I think you can reasonably assume that they're going to consume it, even if, even if we say they're not supposed to. I think it would be, it would make sense to say purchase and consume. Well, the, right. I don't understand the, um, like, what is the distinction, Kyle, in your mind of a special event versus, like, a farmer's market that's like approved for every Saturday as an event like what's the what's the distinction that's not a special that's not a special event from a licensing perspective okay. that's something that you're licensed to do through the state on this day and time and and take over a, you know the parking lots mm -hmm. so it would be Whether, like a one-off not like you'd say I'm gonna do this every Saturday and I want an event license no I'm not saying that okay. I'm saying allowing whether it's let's say i as an easy example you know want to host a special event and i want folks to come to this area that i've already been through local zoning and i want to invite eight retailers and or producers to participate in and it'd be an opportunity for folks with id checks to come and, and speak to producers in a one-on-one -on -one environment where i would still buy it how it otherwise would look at a retail establishment from a packaging labeling perspective. And it would be a one-off event, you know? That that event ends, that they want to do another one, they'd have to come back 
and apply for another one. I, I, I'm not thinking it's a special event, meaning it could happen every week. Okay. You know, as a special way to buy your groceries versus a more traditional way to buy your groceries. I didn't mean to muddy the waters. No, I, that's I, okay. I just wanted to understand. And then the, um, <coughs> when you're talking about purchase and consume, could you bring your own too? Like I think one of the comments we heard like about weddings, for example, or whatever, would be able to have an area that you can bring your own. Well, I mean, it, no one's really going to be policing a wedding, I don't think, you know, as far as people bring a flask or something like that. Uh, but, you know, the idea of the wedding is that you're purchasing, or there's an open bar, you're purchasing from the person, so that there's some control of consumption and overconsumption. Um, so. But there have been, maybe there still are, wedding venues in Vermont that are bring your own. That you don't have to have that you don't have to have a bartender that they're they're BYOB. Yeah. Well, in that instance, I don't think we need to know about any of it. No, <laughs> no, no but they're to... they're a venues. They're they're an actual venue, so they may need, they may want a, a consumption license of some kind in order to allow consumption. I don't know the particulars of how that works exactly. I've been to those weddings. I've been to this <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. I think. Uh, the more we can simplify our lives, the better mm -hmm. um, in, this, in these next couple months. So I would, what I, what I think, when, if we're gonna go through our rules one and two, it'll look at you know, whether a incubator indoor license is necessary. I also think what we should do is, while we're doing that, look at our retail regulations and see what would apply to a farmer's market style event for you know, what regulations we have that cover retail that we would want to see in this style of sale. Um, because again, I thought we, the regulations that we put in place for retail, I kind of thought were the bare minimum that we need to feel comfortable that we're tracking everything and we have the ability to kind of ensure compliance. And, you know, the cash handling, the point of sale, the inventory tracking, the kind of em employee trainings, all, all of those regulations I thought were necessary. This opens the door to a totally different style of retail, which I think we all want to get to, and I think we can all envision um, this happening. But I think it'd be useful for us before we decide to allow, to recommend this, to think about specifically what regulations from our retail would apply to this style this direct consumer retail. But do you, if so, sorry. <laughs> I mean, we're requiring a yeah. safe, you know, for all, you know, that doesn't make sense for outside. Well, yeah, there's well, not going to be. Does it make sense for inside then? That's my question. Well, there's not going to be the same type of cash or product on hand at these very limited, maybe. So you're saying that the product would be limited as well? I mean, the amount of sales would be limited? I think, uh, I think, you can't bring your whole inventory to one of these events and expect to, to sell everything. I think there's certain things that we will obviously need to consider, but other market dynamics and the ability, the, the events from 12 to 4, oh, I can reasonably expect to sell X amount of product. I'm going to bring that with me. And yeah, we probably have to figure out certain regulatory requirements. But I think it's part of the security retail stuff that we have put in place is because those products and that cash are living in that retail establishment at hours where folks otherwise would not be working at the same time of, you know, uh, other considerations that we have to abide by from a, you know, federal compliance perspective. But I think that kind of, you know what I'm trying to say? Like at 1 a.m. it's not gonna be an issue, you know what I mean? I still feel like it would behoove us to look at what we're, I mean, what we've, you know, what we talked about last week is that, you know, we still need some, um, I mean, we put those regulations in place for a reason. And we should go through a similar process of saying, if we're gonna have direct to consumer temporary event retail, um, what, which pieces of this would be necessary for that? Okay. I mean, it's like the chicken or the egg, you know. I think we could still propose it and figure it out. Is, is all is all that I'm saying. 
Are we still, I'm sorry, are we still talking about events? Yeah. Or are we, okay. We're talking about retail at events. Right. And the event style licensing that we're proposing, anybody can get, regardless of what other type of license they have. Or if they don't have another type of license, they yeah. could be just a purveyor of events, right? right. Right, but my idea of the event was that you're not taking the product outside of the event space. It is, everything stays in this oh, I see. place. Just like at a, at a cash bar at a wedding. All right. Um, any other license types that we want to consider at this stage? I think there might be some other ones sprinkled throughout the next two reports that we're going to look at. So, um, but I'm happy to talk about any other license types now. I put all my brain power into those two. Yeah, that was it. Right now, anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> Well then, um, it's 12.30 almost. Do we want to take a break now or do we want to get through the NACB report? Social equity report? How do people feel? I can go either way. I'm indifferent. Yeah. How about Nellie, Kyle, I'm and uh, David Brent? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Break? <laughs> <laughs> break an hour? Does that work? Or? That's plenty. I mean, I, I don't need that much time. Is this a, but do you guys want to eat lunch now or do you want to? Uh, oh. I, don't, I don't care about that. I just need a quick break. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do a quick one. All right, why don't, we, uh, why don't we come back in 15 minutes, 20 till? Okay. Sounds great. Well, why don't we jump back into it? Um, I think next on our agenda is a review of our social equity. Um, subcommittee report, which includes, I think, recommendations that um, NACD collected during those public input hearings as well. So I'm going to do this review of um, our consultant NACD's uh, proposed social equity recommendations, and it, this is a result of their work with the Advisory Committee Subcommittee on Social Equity, and also um, a result of their work in their one-on-one -on -one kind of um, outreach to stakeholders in Vermont, and also the two um, public input sessions that were held uh, during their time here in November. So I'm going to run through these. Um, just a little roadmap here to what's contained in their report um, is uh, a review of the proposal for social equity criteria and the benefits associated with those criteria. This will look familiar because we um, did put some of this language in our October 15th report to the legislature. Also some eco economic empowerment criteria and associated benefits. Um, and then some recommendations for the board and how to create a socially equitable cannabis industry, and then some recommendations um, for legislative action that could promote social equity. So um, with respect to number four, some of these recommendations um, we're going to look at also in context of our January 15th report, which we'll review later in the meeting. So to start the overview of the social equity criteria, um, there are two criteria, so if a person meets um, at least one of these criteria, they can be considered a social equity applicant and have access to the social equity program. So if a person is African American or black or indigenous or Hispanic, or is a person from a community that's historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition, that would satisfy criteria one. Or if a person is convicted of a cannabis-related offense, and that would include um, a person who's been personally convicted um, and incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense, or a person who is a member of an impacted family. Um, and that definition is on the next slide. 
And just a reminder that there is no uh, previous residency requirement for a social equity applicant, but the um, applicant does have to currently reside in Vermont. Can we pause there just sure. for a second? Um, because this is different than what we put in our rules. Yes, it is. Um, and so, I guess this is a question for Julie and Kyle. Do we want to change what we did in our rules to match this? Or do we want to leave what we did in our rules? I think we need to hear the public. I, I personally, I would want to hear the public comment that we're going to get later mm -hmm. this week. Okay. Um, before deciding that. Okay. And I think if I'm if I'm not mistaken, we our our definition might be interpreted to be a little bit broader yep. than this. But that definition that we went with in drafting has looked been looked at more favorably in courts around the country as it gets a little bit further away than specific words that might jeopardize yeah. the program. Yeah, my personal opinion is that this is much more directed towards the people um, that were that the legislation identified and that we're trying to mitigate the harms of prohibition. Our language and in our rules is probably it's exactly what you described, probably more defensible yet broader. Um, just one other just piece of note that you know that convicted or incarcerated, just so we're all just on the same page here, would not include juvenile adjudications under that language. There is no incarceration in, um, for juveniles that are being adjudicated in family court. Um, but that being said, the purpose of family court is to be a rehabilitative alternative to the criminal justice system. And so we could just make the assumption that if you've been adjudicated uh, in the family court that your sentence essentially or your disposition was meant to be rehabilitative and not meant to be punitive like the incarcerated sitting. So. Is it um, convicted and incarcerated if you're if you're tried as an adult? Yes. Right. Just I just wanted plus I no, I just, yeah we, I know at least one legislator has asked if this would include juvenile adjudications and this language would not. Okay. Yeah, no, I think we can revisit it on Friday. Or yeah, mm -hmm. I think just, just yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So here's the definition of impacted family. Um, the person has had or has a parent, legal guardian, child, spouse, or domestic partner, or was dependent of a person who um, was incarcerated for a cannabis related offense. So again, the um, limitation there is that the person um, has to have been incarcerated for that crime. So this is just the definition, Vermont's definition of what domestic partnership means. Um, moving on to what documents would be required for a social e equity candidate to apply for a license. So either um, proof of a person's conviction, which could be court documents or probation documents or DOC documents. Um, and proof of residency. And then there's also a note here that if a person's unable to obtain those proof of conviction documents, um, they can request to self-attest to that conviction. So the proposal is um, that social equity applicants should have their application fee waived. Um, and in addition to the waiver of their application fee, also license fee waiver for the first year um, and then like a progressively smaller waiver of the fee for the first four years of their licensure. And there's also this little note here that um, if a licensee can't pay that 25% uh, of their fee in the second year or 50% of their fee in the third year, um, they can apply for a full fee waiver from the board if they can demonstrate um, as a part of that application that they have a financial need and also they've got a plan to achieve full payment um, moving forward. Um, also recommended, recommended um, that the provisional license application, that um, like intent to apply uh, procedure that we set out in rule, um, the fee associated with that would also be waived. Um, a waiver of employee registration cards and also there's a recommendation that the local fee um, be waived. And these fees here are all um, 
part of our proposal that we put forward to the legislature in October. Um, so, so those decisions haven't been made yet. Yeah, can we pause here? Yep. So employee registration card fee, um, I would assume that that means a social equity, someone who meets the criteria of social equity applicant employee, not employer. because we're, we're decoupling the employee, or we're suggesting that they decouple. So mm -hmm. just, I just want to be clear on some of this stuff. And then the other, the local fee, um, we don't have the ability to waive this. I was going to ask that. Right. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't, I can't support us waiving a local fee without asking for it in our budget. You know, someone has to pay it. And so we would have to, we could waive it, but then we would pay it. And so we would want to know roughly, have some rough estimation of how, how much money we need to set aside to pay that local mm -hmm. fee. So anyway, I, I just, um, Fair enough. we have to go one way or the other on that. I, we can't, we can't just waive it though. We included that in our October 15th report though, didn't we? Waiving local fees or did we not? No, I don't think that was a part of okay. that report. I don't think it would have slipped by me there. I, okay. I just, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's paying to offset administrative costs at the yes. local level, so yep. someone has to pay it. Yep. All right, thanks. Okay. So next are the recommendations regarding the business ownership of a social equity license. So um, the, re the recommended requirements are that businesses have to be at least 51% um, owned by either one or more social equity candidates. Um, and there's also a recommendation that an applicant can request a waiver from the board for a 50-50 split ownership. Uh, the candidate has to be involved with daily operations and be able to make uh, decisions for the business. And also the candidate must meet state requirements to open a business. Um, next are the recommendations on uh, license transfer. So if a licensee, a social equity licensee wants to transfer to another social equity business, that's permitted. Um, but the new licensee w benefits would start at the second year of those reduced license fees, regardless of when the business is transferred. So that, that's a requirement. Um, and the second year is a 25% uh, fee. If the business is transferred to a social equity affiliate owner or anyone that has control over the business or a social equity family member, the new licensee ha would have to take over the previous owner's fee schedule. And if the transfer occurs um, to a non-social equity licensee within five years of the social equity applicant first getting the license, the new business holder would have to repay um, to the social equity program any cost savings that that um, license received during those first five years. And if it's after five years, then transfer of ownership is allowed to anyone without a repayment requirement. Can I ask a, a question about this? Is this something that the legislature would have to adopt or something that we have to write into rule? And the reason I'm asking is there's obviously financial impact, right? I think this is essentially recouping money. So this is this would be a net benefit, a, a positive yeah. to the board. So I don't think the legislature would, you know, if they approve the plan for the fee waiver, then I don't think they would have to approve this. Okay, right. thank you. So the benefits that would come along with being a social equity licensee, um, there would be priority of review, the board's review of the license application, um, the reduced and waived fees as we, as we discussed, um, education courses or certificates, technical assistance in certain areas including application assistance, business management, job training, and then guidance on tax and legal issues. Um, access to the Cannabis Business Development Fund, and also access to peer-to-peer -peer networks um, information and just generally consolidated, clear, and concise information on what the program entails. So just, <laughs> no, <was> okay. uh, <laughs> just to be clear he, on this slide, you know, we don't have education or Cannabis Certificate courses right now, and we don't have peer-to-peer -peer networks that we are, can facilitate at this point. So while we can, at, just at the outset of the program, if we're gonna think about you know, 
April 1st and May 1st is the outset. We can certainly do priority licensing review. We can certainly waive fees. Um, we can do the technical assistance to the extent that uh, it's written in statute. And the Cannabis Business Development Fund, when that comes online, is also available. Um, but those two, you know, I just, this is a recommendation from NACB and our subcommittee. This isn't stuff that necessarily we can just flip a switch and do. So I think we're already working on peer networking. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are, I know that we are. I am yeah. already working on peer networking. <laughs> <laughs> I need to say it so indirectly. That yeah. is a plan for the, like, hopefully to start at the end of this month. That's great. Yeah, I mean, these are all fantastic benefits. I hope we have the budget to put some teeth behind them. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, this slide lays out how the board will prioritize granting licenses to social equity applicants. So you'll have to remember criteria what criteria one and two are to understand the slide. So um, candidates that meet both those criteria um, would would have sort of first crack at the licenses. Um, candidates that just meet criteria one, which is the race-based um, criteria or um, proof that you've come from a community that's been disproportionately impacted, um, would come next, and then. And then third would be candidates that just meet that criteria too about with a um, cannabis related conviction and incarceration. Um. I, on this, mm -hmm. I agree with the principle here. Certainly people that meet both criteria are the people that have been most directly impacted. Um, I'm not sure about the one only versus two only. Um, you know, someone whose spouse had a three strike law and was incarcerated for life for a cannabis related offense might be more directly impacted than someone who only meets criteria one. I wonder how difficult it's gonna to be to operationalize this um, given our current staffing levels. I just, I think we're halfway, our staff is halfway through reviewing a social equity applicant, all of a sudden another one comes in that meets one and two or you know, and then all of a sudden everything has to be paused and shifted around. I understand the, again, the, the thinking behind this slide, but I, I wonder if this is something that we really um, need to keep the about. Yeah. yeah. And we still have to, we haven't written a policy about how we're gonna prioritize applications, right? right? So um, we can address this then, I think. Yeah, I just, I'm trying to, I, I reviewed the, these slides um, last week and I just wanted to just flag, my, it. flag my notes mm -hmm. on it. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I like the thinking here. It's just dependent on us being able to figure out how to do it effectively. Right. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the Cannabis Business Development Fund slide. Um, so just some facts to start out with. That $500,000 allocation is pretty limited. Um, there may be some additional funding that comes in from the integrated licenses. Um, expenditures from the fund are listed here, loans and grants uh, to social equity applicants, um, payment for outreach that could be provided or targeted to attract and um, retain social equity applicants, and assist with job training and technical assistance for social equity applicants, which are all of the um, the expenditures that are identified in the legislation establishing the fund, and then also um, an additional one, which is funding incubator programs that have demonstrated success. Yeah, so this one, I think it's just important for us to remember that we're not in charge of allocating the funds that's going to either ACCD or a third party. And they're, unless the statute changes, they're gonna be limited to those first three bullets under expenditures in the fund. The last one um, is not authorized by statute, which Brain just said. Just wanted to underscore that. Okay, so um, what should be included in the social equity application is proof of residency, um, either proof or attestation of social equity qualification any incorporating documents um, so that the board can identify the ownership criteria, um, a description of the social equity candidate's role in the organization, 
and, and then lastly, an explanation of how the applicant is impacted by cannabis prohibition. Okay, I'm gonna move to the economic empowerment program. So the idea here was to create a program um, that would provide some opportunities for people from communities that have been historically underrepresented in society and to encourage people from those um, communities to participate in the industry. And here are the um, types of the groups to be considered for this economic empowerment program. I'm not going to read it as you guys can read. Um, so the economic empowerment business ownership requirements um, would be at least 51% owned by the economic empowerment candidate. And again, there's that provision that an uh, e economic empowerment applicant can request a waiver for a 50-50 split ownership. Um, again, they have to be involved with the daily operations and be able to make decisions for the business. And they must meet state requirements to open a business. So similar requirements here, ownership requirements, as for the social equity program. Um, and then the benefits of this program would be a priority licensing review. Again, a waiver of the application fees, um, not the license fees, but just the initial application fee. And then that they receive technical assistance in um, the same areas of technical assistance as social equity applicants. Their application should include proof of residency proof of the, their qualification as an economic empowerment candidate, their incorporation documents so the board can determine um, control of the organization, and then a description of, their, of the candidate's role and responsibilities in the company. So same, same application requirements apart from that last one about um, a narrative about the disproportionate impact. So um, here are some recommendations of how the, the board can consider how to establish a socially equitable industry. Um, and they include requiring as a condition of licensure that um, employees pay livable wages. Um, and that would be exclusive of any samples or vouchers provided by an employee. Um, the, Licensees creating an incubator or an accelerator program for social equity licensees um, that could include grants um, or access to capital, access to retail space or cultivation or manufacturing space, uh, management training, other kinds of technical training, and mentorship from industry experts. Um, also, the board should consider uh, inclusive hiring, requiring inclusive hiring and contracting practices and community reinvestment plans. And much of this is a part of um, the board's work on the priority, um, the positive impact criteria that you've done in rule two. Um, also, with respect to creating a socially equitable cannabis industry, um, an acknowledgement here that, that uh, there's trauma that exists between law enforcement and social equity candidates and disproportionately impacted communities. And as a result, law enforcement shouldn't be the primary enforcement mechanism for the industry. Um, there's a recommendation here that the board be very clear, um, have clear communication to licensees about what kinds of regulations could result in violations. And also just that the board um, conduct outreach to create relationships between the board and it, the people it regulates. Um, and then I'm just gonna keep trucking unless somebody interrupts me, but the next slide is legislative action. Um, so these are recommendations that, the, that um, the board could recommend to the legislature to promote social equity. So um, the first bullet here is exclusivity periods for new license types, and specifically co-op delivery, on-site consumption, and special events. Um, elimination of the concentrate caps on both flour and products. Um, expansion of expungement eligibility to include all nonviolent offenses. Uh, the creation of a fund um, 
for disproportionately impacted communities. Um, the creation of a social equity board. Uh, funding ongoing assistance and educational programs for social equity applicants. A clarification of the zoning designation for small outdoor cultivators. An allocation of tax revenue to the Cannabis Business Development Fund. And a creation of a social equity trust to allow for public donations to fund social equity programming. So the following slides um, provide some more detail on some of these recommendations. So the first is a co-op license. Um, and the idea here is that social equity applicants can pool their resources that, um, that come from the Cannabis Business Development Fund to cooperatively operate a business. And uh, that could include cultivating in different areas of the state and then processing and selling from one central location. Um, here's a recommendation on the different types of delivery licenses. So we've got three tiers here, the first being a transport model that would allow um, a delivery licensee, this would be a social equity applicant, um, that meets certain criteria set by the board, could deliver and transport um, among all sectors of the industry. The second tier would be a retailer model, so that would be where the social equity um, delivery licensee is hired by the retailer as an employee. Um, and then the customer would order from the retailer and the delivery license holder would be the person delivering to the customer. And then third tier delivery operators would be allowed to purchase cannabis from uh, a cultivator or a product manufacturer and then sell to consumers. Okay, next one is the on-site consumption and special events license type. So the recommendation here is to create a license type or to recommend to the legislature that they create a license type for on-site consumption. Um, the board should consider an exclusivity period for social equity applicants. Um, currently there's prohibition to consume in all places of public accommodation, uh, public spaces, motor vehicles, federal housing. The board has talked about this in multiple meetings. Um, On-site consumption offers people a safe place to consume and um, sort of equitably offers people a safe place to consume. Also reduces public consumption and the um, interaction of law enforcement with individuals who are consuming. Um, and the second recommendation here is to recommend a license type for special events and for the board to consider an exclusivity period for social equity applicants. And again, this would provide a safer, regulated alternative for people um, who consume at special events. So um, we were going to, I don't know if we officially decided whether we wanted to recommend on-site consumption um, as part of our January 15th. Um, we talked about it earlier today. Uh, was that where we landed? Was that our consensus? So we would offer this as a license type recommend that it be created. Social consumption? Yeah, yeah. on site consumption. Um, can, yes. Yeah. That's my thought. Yep, I'm comfortable okay. with that. All right. Why don't we do that? And do we want the exclusivity period for social equity applicants? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. You want to talk about special events now? Or? <laughs> no. Maybe when we, we'll talk about that in context of the report. Yeah, we yeah. have a yeah. recommendation or report on that. Yep, we do. Okay, so I'll move on to the um, recommendation that we, that the board recommend to the legislature that they eliminate the THC cap. Um, so the first is to remove the 30% THC cap for flour and the 60% THC cap for solid concentrates. The second part of this recommendation the board has already done. Um, there's a narrative here that the high THC products uh, represent about 20 to 30 percent of the market in other legal states. So putting a cap on these products um, per perpetuates the illicit market activity and the risk of increased arrest for cannabis offenses. And as the board has mentioned before, there are racial disparities for drug arrests and sentencing uh, are really ongoing problems. And continuing to prohibit those products um, 
again, asks communities of color to bear the burden of these disproportionately um, policed policies. And then the second point here is to uh, ensure that remediation is available for any crop that exceeds that existing 30% um, cap. I think we've already put point two. Cool. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not illegal to possess a flower that has higher than thirty percent THC. It's illegal. It's prohibited to sell it. Yeah, it's different than I think what folks might be accustomed to under the hemp program, where they allowed it to be federally legal as hemp at a certain percentage, and it would otherwise be right. You know, at that point in time, illegal at the state and federal level. Um, and have to remediate it, you know, because at any point, if it was above that testing limit of 0.02% THC, it was, you know, not federally legal under the federal program that authorized the program. So, I just, I'm looking at that sec third sentence in the first bullet point, and, and that's the point that I think is important for public consumption, which is that it is illegal to consume openly. Um, and that's where I really do think that uh, racial disparities in arrests for that, citations, sentencing, et cetera, really do come into play. But I don't know that that statement there really holds true for um, someone who's in possession of high THC cannabis. Um, but we, just just like you said, Kyle, we do have a process to ensure remediation. Yeah. It's not like the hemp program where you need to immediately right. destroy it in, in, under a certain set of circumstances. Yeah. You're automatically in violation of law. But I, I think, as you said, it's illegal to sell it and put it into the marketplace. It's not illegal to possess it. Yeah. I'm just trying to think how we can, within our kind of our mission um, and our guidance and our legislative intent, how we could recommend getting rid of the 30% THC cap for flour. So just to address the first thing that you said, because I reread the sentence there while you were talking, um, I do think that there would continue to be disparities, right? If you have something that's over this, um, over the, the THC cap, then I think that the assumption is that it would be sold illicitly, right? And so that's, and we already know the policing for that is, there's a disparate impact for the policing of that, right? But the, um, if you're a non-licensee and you're in possession, yes. But if you, I think the assumption is that that's is the sale is the issue, right? Never mind. <laughs> the the thing that stuck out to me is yeah. just you know one comment that we heard is or I've heard along the way is just that you know the the on-site consumption, giving people a safe place to consume is important because if the only alternative for folks to legally consume is out, it, 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 not legally consume, the only place that a person can consume is out in the open, that you know, you're subjecting yourself to police enforcement. Um, or at least interaction. Or interaction. Mm -hmm. And then that, you know, we've seen the kind of racial disparities that exist in those interactions. But if you're just merely in possession of flour that's at 31% THC, that's not a crime. That is my, is my only point. Okay. And then your your question was, should we recommend removing the 30% right. THC cap? Okay, sorry. Yeah, the question is, do we see it within our mission um, to make that recommendation. To remove the 30% cap? Yeah, to ask that it be removed. I'm trying to think safe, equitable, effective market. Um, there's probably some connection there. Um, encouraging the legacy market to participate. There might be a nexus there. Yeah, I don't have a problem with recommending that. I don't either. Yeah. I think that there's some cultivators that can achieve it under the right set of circumstances. I think, you know, most likely might try, you know, as a book out there, but people can do it. Is the justification for me, I mean, we weren't asked to recommend that, so it's kind of, we're acting in our own, we're acting kind of on our own on this. 
business. So I think if we're going to recommend it, we would want to tie it back to this, you know our central mission. So is it just that that first sentence that these high THC flour is present in the illicit market and therefore it should be allowed in the legal market? Yes, I think if the if if the if the legislature wants as much of the legacy market to move into the regulated market as possible, then yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. I think it's more important on the concentrate side, but right. I recognize that it's still an okay. issue on the flower side. We did already recommend it on the concentrate side, though. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like the that second bullet we'd like to add to, or I mean the removal of the cap for flour, you would like to add to the January 15th report? Yeah. Okay, the next slide has to do with expungement. <clears throat> um, so as, as we've discussed previously in this, um, in these slides, uh, prohibition has Pro, has perpetrated intergenerational harm on communities of color. Arrests and sentencing practices of people of color um, persist to this day. Disparate arrests and sentencing practices. Criminal history records entrap people in a cycle of crime and poverty. And expanding el expungement eligibility to nonviolent convictions is a, an important step in mitigating some of these harms. So here's a recommendation um, that the legislature create um, a fund to provide tax revenue um, to disproportionately impacted communities. Um, the recommendation is that at least 20% of the tax revenue um, for cannabis products be put in the fund and allocated um, for various uh, purposes, including education, job training, reentry supports, legal assistance, youth development, violence prevention, mental health, grants for community development and needs, and subsidized product testing for social equity cannabis licensees. Um, and then the final recommendation here is the social equity board and their responsibilities. Um, so this recommendation is that the legislature create a board um, that would ensure accountability um, of the board in its social equity program and social equity program success. So it would assist in developing and deploying the social equity program. Um, it would administer this recommended fund for disproportionately impacted communities. Um, it would conduct community outreach and education on the social equity program would also review social equity applications um, and do collection and reporting of racially disaggregated data on participants in the program. It would develop and track performance measures and data on the program. And lastly, it would review the business development fund disbursements. And then the final slide is um, a list of the representatives that should be appointed to this social equity board. Um, which includes a representative from a disproportionately impacted community that currently resides in that community, um, a representative from a disproportionately impacted community who is experienced in community development, um, a person who is arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense, a family member of somebody who's been arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense, a social worker from a disproportionately impacted community that currently serves that community, an educator um, from one of these communities that currently serves that community, a business owner from a disproportionately impacted community, um, a licensed social equity cannabis representative from uh, one of the sectors of either the sector of retail processing or cultivating, um, a licensed social equity cannabis representative from a delivery of, or cooperative license, um, an licensed non-social equity cannabis representative, a social equity candidate that currently works in the cannabis industry. Um, I think this may refer to the um, executive director of racial equity, the agency of commerce and community development, 
a member of the Social Equity Caucus, and a member of the board. Is it our plan to talk about which of these recommendations we want to include in the January 15th report later, and which we don't? Are we going to readdress these recommendations at some point? I think now is the time, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There. I've been trying to pause kind of yeah. along the way, but is there some, I mean, we should, we should, I think, talk about this report now. Yeah, so I, I've thought about this a lot, actually, this social equity board, and I think um, I would really like to see us look at the composition of our advisory committee rather than create a separate board, if that's something that we're, if this is a recommendation that we as a board are thinking about, I would mm -hmm. rather see us look at the composition of our advisory committee than to create another yeah. board. Did, did you work, was this part of the social equity subcommittee? They did, talked about this, this. Yeah. Do you know how closely this mirrors, and I should have just looked it up, but H414, is it the same composition? Um, I do not remember off the top of my head. I ask I because- I remember looking at the Yeah, time, I right, I, it doesn't, it, I only ask because, you know, disproportionately impacted communities, when we tried to define that as a board and as a subcommittee, we ran into some issues mm -hmm. um, of being both simultaneously over-inclusive and under-inclusive. Yeah. Um, when you do it by geography, yeah. um, whether that's zip code or economic opportunity zones or by policing districts, et cetera. You know, when we tried to do it by geography, we realized that it wasn't gonna work in a state this small. Um, but I know that H414, or I think H414, uses that based on geography. They try and determine an impacted community by kind of a geographic balance. Yep. What we did, of course, was we said that if you're part of a BIPOC community, uh, if you are black or African American or indigenous or Hispanic, you are de facto a disproportionately and from a disproportionately impacted community. So I'm just wondering um, if that's what was intended here. And I know, um, Julie, you worked, you know, you were kind of the board representative to the social equity subcommittee. I was wondering if they talked about that. I don't remember off the top of my head if the discussion about what a disproportionately impacted community. I don't, I don't know if they got really deep into that particular okay. conversation. That's but huge, obviously. It yes. runs through the first yeah. kind of like six members, right. seven members. Yes. Or just however many. It does not mirror the composition of the board proposed in 414. Okay. When you say look at our advisory committee, what exactly do you mean? Well, you know, maybe we should be adding members there that um, that bring a social equity perspective. To our advisory To our advisory okay. committee, yes. I didn't know if you were trying to select certain members of our advisory committee to stand up like a, a subcommittee. No, I think if we, if, if we really want social equity to be part of the program Everything we do. and, yeah. you know, to systemically eradicate it, then, then social equity needs to be part of the system. So there may be maybe an educator or you know, family member, maybe they need to be part of the advisory committee rather than a separate board. Yeah. Not to create a board of like 40 people though yeah. either, I think you'd have to think about. Yeah, how many people is this board? I think it's 14 or 15. Yeah, 14. And there was a lot of discussion about, about whether it should be. It's a big board. Yes. And I have my own concerns about being able to find enough volunteers to participate in it. I mean, boards all over the state are having trouble finding volunteers of all kinds. Of and is this really um, a cannabis social equity board? I, can you go back, Bryn, to the charge of this board? It just, it, to me, it feels like, so the, we asked to create a, so they're in charge of kind of reviewing cannabis business development fund disbursements. That's directly related to the cannabis industry. But I think we all, this is, it just seems like this, their mission is broader than just dealing with the cannabis industry specifically. So the, in, administer the cannabis disproportionately impacted communities fund. 
So that's a fund that's supported by cannabis excise tax revenue, but it's not to it's not designed to support the cannabis industry. And it just feels like uh, this board is broader than the cannabis board. Um, it's broader than just looking at the industry. And maybe that's a distinction without a difference. Maybe we don't. Maybe it doesn't matter. I think you're right about the second bullet. I think the other bullets, though, are intended to be specific to cannabis. Okay. Right. Like so, you know, um, like the second to last, develop and track performance measures on data, social equity program. I mean, that we would want to do that for our social equity program. Yeah, I think we're involved. Yeah. We do that regardless. But yeah, I just it seems to me if you're going to create, you know, we have a 14 member advisory committee. If you're going to create a, a new 14-member board, that their mission might be a little bit broader. So I'm kind of, lean, I think I'm just tilting towards where you're at, which mm -hmm. is let's change the makeup of our advisory committee, and they can do all of these things. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think a new board that we might have trouble filling, even with you know the right attention on it still making decisions here with that big of a board recognizing that it's hard to get every single member of a board to a meeting it means that you're effectively making these decisions with a quorum and leaving out voices potentially yeah. right mm -hmm. i don't know so from this i think we should just look at the composition of our advisory committee and try right. to be more inclusive yeah okay and that would then cover our entire operation, not strictly yeah. through the lens of the social equity program. Mm -hmm. So, any other comments throughout this report that we want to return to? Is that it? That's it. That's mm -hmm. it. I don't think so. Um, all right. Uh, Bryn, do we want to take a break or do we want to just jump into our January 15th? So, that's up to you. We can jump right in. I haven't included um, the decisions that you made about the on-site consumption, but it sounds like you're gonna, you may have returned to that conversation anyway. Okay. Um, so as long as you're okay with that not being in there at the moment, we can jump right in. That's a 30% cut. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, how, do, how does everyone else feel? Julie and Kyle, do you want to power through? Um, January 15th? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 1.30, we've been out for two and a half hours. Let's roll. <laughs> <laughs> Nelly and David, do you? Let's go. Let's all do right. this. Okay. <laughs> Orca, are you up for it? All right. Um, all right. Why don't we just go, go for it then, Brian? Okay. I'm just downloading it. Welcome to Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is a draft of the report. Um, our, our last legislative report due this year so far. Um, so the board saw this on Thursday at the advisory committee meeting. Um, I did have time to include um, at least one of the decisions that you made this morning. Um, but as I mentioned, it doesn't include everything, so. Overview of the presentation. Um, this, this legislative report is specifically um, to discuss a summary of some of the social equity outreach that, the, that we've done, uh, make a recommendation on online ordering and delivery, uh, make recommendations about additional license types, um, a recommendation about CBD and potency, and then lastly, the paraphernalia recommendation. So I'm gonna skip through these because you've seen these multiple times about our advisory committee and our consultants. Um, here's the legislative language setting out the requirements of this report. Through that. Um, this is our public comment slide that we like to include in all of our legislative reports with updated numbers about the number of board meetings we've had um, and public comments we've received. So the first section of the report is responsive to 164 section 5G1, and this is a summary of our work with um, ACCD and some other um, state partners on um, programs 
to provide economic opportunities to people who've been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. Um, so we've got some language here on the board's mission statement, and um, that includes that cannabis prohibition has disproportionately harmed black and brown people for generations. And it's central to the board's vision um, to create a program that provides economic opportunities in the cannabis industry for these people. And um, then it summarizes our work to develop a social equity um, kind of vision statement, and we've included it there. So this slide provides a summary of the, of the direct outreach that the board has done um, to develop an equitable program. So it's been the strategy of the board from the outset to hear from all possible stakeholders in the marketplace. Um, we've received extraordinary levels of public involvement um, as set out in that summary slide of our board meetings and public comment periods. Um, so during its meetings, board has heard from small cultivators, policy advocates, experts on racial justice and social equity issues, and people with lived experience of those issues, medicinal cannabis patients and experts, public health experts and advocates, environmental and energy experts and advocates, agricultural experts and advocates, and more. A description of NACB's work to hold public engagement sessions um, and have one-on-one -on -one discussions with people um, from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. And then lastly, um, just a narrative about board members, extensive discussions with members of the public and experts and advocates for social equity in the industry. So we've had initial conversations with staff at ACCD on their role in administering the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Um, we've also had discussions with other state government entities regarding economic opportunities um, for communities that have been disproportionately impacted and to identify some existing opportunities um, for social equity outreach assistance and training. And we're gonna continue that work. There will be additional information um, provided to the legislature in this part of the report. So um, this is kind of an opportunity for us to reiterate our social equity criteria and what our program is going to look like. So um, the social equity criteria are listed here, um, and we have it as the first criteria is if you, um, you are a person of color or anyone who can demonstrate you're from a community that has been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. Or the second criteria, if you have been personally incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense or have a family member that's been incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense. No residency required. Applicant has to currently reside in Vermont. And then the bottom half of the slide is a summary of the social equity program. So um, applicants, social equity applicants shall be eligible for um, an application fee waiver and a license fee waiver um, in the first year, a full waiver in the first year, and then a reduction on the schedule um, that was set out in the recommendations from NACB. That first year is a 75% reduction. I'm sorry, first year is full fee waiver, second year 75%, third year 50%, fourth year 25%. Um, board shall host entrepreneurial outreach sessions to encourage participation in the market. Social equity applicants and license holders shall be eligible for disbursements from the Business Development Fund, also eligible for application assistance from the board, business and technical assistance, programming as developed by the board, and access to educational resources. So um, beyond this work of the board to develop an equitable cannabis marketplace, um, General Assembly can also create policy to mitigate the long-standing social and economic inequity that's fueled by prohibition. So the, the board encourages the legislature to adopt these policies. So the first is the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Um, the statement that it's not adequately funded to provide ongoing meaningful economic opportunity to social equity applicants. Um, and this is a recommendation that the legislature allocate a percentage, specifically 20% of the cannabis excise tax revenue to that fund on an annual basis. 
And the second recommendation here is that the legislature create a cannabis community reinvestment fund to direct cannabis revenue to communities that have been disproportionately harmed by cannabis prohibition, and again, to allocate a percentage of the tax revenue to that fund annually. And then some suggestions about how revenue from that fund can be used. So, um, you know, I raised the concern last week. I know I supported the inclusion of the 20%. I really, you know, in thinking about it, do not think it's our place to put a specific number on that. Um, I really do feel like that first statement that it's not adequately adequately funded um, is the most important message that we can deliver. And I really think that we're operating kind of outside of our bounds um, by recommending a specific percentage amount. You know, we recommended a specific percentage in our local fee uh, or our local excise tax contribution to local municipalities. I think that really was reflective of um, the fact that we needed to have, you know, towns opt in and have an incentive to opt in. I, I, I didn't feel comfortable then by including an amount, um, but we did. Um, I, I don't think we should include an amount here. Um, I think that we just need to really say that it's not adequately funded and the legislature needs to grapple with what the right number is. And on the second point, the second bullet, um, the three sub bullets that we have there, I think are all good things. Um, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, it, it seems like we're putting a list together that, um, you know, it can go one of two ways. We can say these are important things, which they are. Um, they're not totally inclusive of what the social equity subcommittee recommended. So I would say either we, we just put forward what the social equity subcommittee recommended, which was, I think, a more of like a 10 point bullet, um, and just say this, this is the, you know, the folks that really dug in and thought about it, this is what they suggested. Um, or we just get rid of that kind of sub list there, those three points, and just say this is a real, like, you know, not everyone who's been harmed by prohibition wants to participate in the cannabis industry, but this cannabis community reinvestment fund might be a good way to mitigate those harms. So um, to start with your first point, I'm a little afraid not to put a, an amount, a percentage in there. <laughs> hey, hey, I, you know, I think if we have a thought on what that should be and have a recommendation and we have an opportunity to make a recommendation, we should do it. I don't think that we were asked for any additional social equity recommendations at all, so we're already putting something in the report that we weren't asked for, um, and it's an opportunity for us to do that. I, you know, the reason why I'm hesitant about 20%, putting a specific number, period, is we don't know what the excise tax is going to look like. We're essentially picking a number out of the blue, and, uh, you know, is that $8 million a year, is it $10 million a year, is it 15, you know, and it's yeah. kind of, you know, it just seems to me that putting a specific amount, it's kind of like, well, why'd you choose that amount? Well, we thought it was good. We thought it was an adequate amount. It, to me, it, it's just not, it seems more like advocacy as opposed to, you know, trying to create a equitable market. I think it's our job to make sure that there's an equitable market. Um, I don't think that 20% is necessarily based upon anything other than we all kind of said, mm, 20%. Did the, the subcommittee recommend 20%? Um, not for that, I don't think. Or is that for the community to reinvestment the, fund? It was uh, five to 10 for this. I think saying that it's not adequately funded is the thing that we need to say. Um, that $500,000 is not, you know, even if it was all put towards a single licensee, it wouldn't be enough to kind of create a viable business. I think that that's, I think the first sentence is the most important part, and the 20% kind of, it puts us in the position of saying, why'd you come up with that? And it distracts from the fact that 
you know, it's not adequately funded. I think that's the most important thing that we need to say. I agree with that. I think, I think my only concern is we need to give some type of starting point, at least, if nothing else, because I think too often you see in, at the legislature they don't know where to begin, especially with cannabis. <laughs> so how do we, if we're not going to settle on a specific number, how do we frame the conversation a little bit more dialed in than just saying it's not adequately funded? I mean, it's just the way that I see this is that it's our job to use our authority to create a equitable marketplace. We've done that in any number of places, including our social priority social equity criteria and our prioritization, our requirement on inclusive hiring practices, our requirement on um, inclusive contracting processes, investments from our largest industry participants to the Community Development Fund. We pushed the limits of what I think is within our authority to make an inclusive marketplace. It's up to the legislature to decide how they spend this revenue. And if they're getting a recommendation from us, it should be that some of it should go towards this fund. And I just don't feel comfortable saying how much. I don't, I, you know, if there's an additional $8 million contribution or 10 or 15 or $20 million contribution every year, I, I don't feel like I have any way to, any toehold to say that's the right amount or that's not the right amount. Um, so I just, that's, that's where I'm at on the 20%. I would prefer to leave it in. I, I think that we can, um, if it's how that money could be spent, I think we could probably outline that for the legislature, if that's the concern. Um, I, I agree with Kyle on that. What I'm afraid of is that there's no place to start. I mean, there are a lot of entities that are asking already for cannabis excise tax money. If we don't provide some sort of place to start, it, it could be zero. We don't have to provide the place to start. That is, my point is that's an advocacy role, and we're not necessarily advocates in this. We are trying to regulate the industry. We're not trying to, you know, there's, there's H414 has a contribution in it to this fund. There's, um, I know, um, you know, Keisha was, Keisha Ram was advocating for a certain amount. That's the kind of proper role of a legislator or an advocate, and that's not our role. Um, you know, I think we need to do what we can do using our authority, and I, I just, to me, I mean, how much in your mind is 20% of the excise tax? I don't know, we're just gonna do the math. <laughs> well, as I'm saying, it's just like, if we don't even know that, then why are we recommending Well, I don't know off the top of my head. Can I do the math? Absolutely. Well, Can I find a way to spend it? Absolutely. <laughs> um, it just yeah. feels to me like we're a little bit outside of what we've been asked to do to kind of recommend a very specific amount of the tax revenue supporting this fund. I mean, what's to say that 20% shouldn't go towards the community reinvestment funds or all 100% should go to the community reinvestment fund? You know, it's just... Right, but this is just some recommendation. So the legislature can take it up or they or they don't, you know. That's, I don't know that it's, I mean, I get what you're saying about advocacy versus, um, you know, regulation, but it seems like they would want to ask the people who've been thinking and talking about this for months for what, what the appropriate amount might be or where to start. Right. I don't think that's us. I think that that's the people that formed the subcommittee, that were members of the subcommittee. I think it's people like the Vermont Co uh, Equity Coalition. I feel like it's people with lived experience in this. I don't think, I don't think it's up to us to put a specific percentage amount that's somewhat arbitrary. So what if we included the amount at least that the subcommittee recommended, the five to 10%? That was something that I was going to raise. If we're not going to, I, I certainly appreciate that we don't have the record built to go in and justify that 20 percent will, you know, solve the problems when it comes to 
that specific fund because we don't know what that number's going to look like, even from a you know equitable percentaging it out perspective of the total revenue generated. But I think we would be remiss to not give them a starting point. I think if we're going to eliminate the 20 percent, then that first sentence needs to be a little bit more dialed in, or if we go with the subcommittee's recommendation, because then at least we have a footing to stand on, because the those folks have talked to people and you know experts and advocates in other parts of the country that have seen similar programs either succeed or not. Mm -hmm. And they received public comment and they held the town halls and so forth. So are we, and what about the community reinvestment funds? I mean, to me, in some ways, that has the ability to have systemic impact. Um, you know, it just seems to me like if we're getting specific in one place and not the other, it just, it, it, I just, Essentially what we're doing here is we are being very specific about this without, I mean, I just, if I was asked why 20%, I would say, well, we just, we saw it five to 10% over here and we decided to do 20%. So I, I don't have it up, but I think that the subcommittee made a, a recommendation for the community uh, reinvestment fund too. And if, if the concern is Translating what our, our subcommittee said into the report that goes to the legislature, I would rather do that than say nothing. And I think it was 20% for the community. I have to pull it up or maybe. Do you want me to have, yeah, just do you switch have to it? it? Yep. 20% to the disproportionately impacted communities fund. And 5 to 10% for the other. I think that I suggested. Them. Flipping them because it seems like the immediate need for the cannabis industry is for the business fund. Is that an ongoing need? Is my question. Well, no, it may not be. But so maybe that's not the right thing to do. Um, but I still agree with the general concept of flipping them because from the disproportionately impacted communities fund. I mean, you know, those those communities there's more going on there than just cannabis and there's ARPA funding coming into the to the state there's federal dollars flowing in to help certain communities and the governor and his state of the state did as we heard from our advisory committee you should strengthen those bullets or whatever to reflect certain you know comments made by the governor and his state of the state address to prioritize a lot of those issues um, over the course of the next year I mean, I would say the opposite is true. The ARPA funding is one-time funding. This is a dedicated revenue stream. Once the market is somewhat saturated, are we really going to need 20% of the excise tax annually to um, go into a fund that, you know, first of all, we don't even know how it's going to be allocated yet. We don't know who's allocating it. Um, so I, to me, it's just kind of like the ARPA funding it seems to me like you want a dedicated revenue source towards community reinvestment that's systemic as opposed to one time. Um, and the cannabis business development funds, I mean, if it just sits there and grows every year and it's not being distributed, it's not being dispersed, then, you know, is that really the best use of the money? I don't know. This so, is why I, just, I don't feel comfortable saying a specific percentage. So the legislature would review, right? Don't they review with every budget where all tax money goes, right? So this would be a recommendation for now. They, they may not do it in the next budget year or the next budget cycle. Like, none of this is permanent, right? Like, <laughs> I just want to say more. I just want to say more than it's not adequately funded. I yeah. feel like that's a, a little bit of a cop out in a in a certain in a certain you know, way. Do we have the record to support the 20%? Maybe not, and I totally agree with you there, but I think we need to be a little bit stronger in, in acknowledging that that, fu that that fund is underfunded, and yeah, I don't want to just speak to speak words, but I think that we need to give them some type of direction on, on how we are going to arrive at how it's adequately funded. And I would be fine if we put in what our subcommittee recommended, because that's what we have a record of them looking at, right? What was the conversation like around that five to ten percent recommendation? Um, I don't remember. 
Like, I don't remember the specifics of those meetings at this point. I mean, I could certainly look back at my notes and remind myself, but no, I don't remember the details of each of the conversations. All right. Um, I remember that they spent a lot of time thinking about it. Like, I, I don't remember precisely how they landed on each percentage, but I do remember that it was, it, the discussion happened over more than one meeting. Were they looking at our projected revenues? I don't remember that. I don't know if we had, I'm trying to remember if we had our projected revenues when they had this conversation. So they may not have had all of the data available at that time. If that's the case, if we need to look at projected revenues, then we should just look at that and come up with our own percent. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they got there because, you know, entering this market is is cost prohibitive. And so even if you're looking at 5 to 10 percent of X millions of dollars, granted, we don't know how many social equity applicants we're going to get, but, you know, from a right sizing our program perspective, I want to say 20, but I, I, I agree. We don't have the record to support it necessarily. But yeah, you know. I understand that. I'm fine with that. You know, putting the subcommittee's recommendations, but I don't think I think we need to put a percentage in, perhaps for both. If that's if that's your concern, Pepper. That I think we just need to, if nothing else, even if it's not a percentage. We need to figure out a way to elaborate a little bit in more detail yeah. um, than just providing that first it, that first bullet. So that doesn't help us arrive at a destination yet. But I just want to go back and look at what the fund can be used for. So it can be used for low interest rate grants and loans, um, outreach job training and technical assistance. I'm just trying to think, you know, are these, are these ongoing expenses? Are they kind of early market? You know, once the market's kind of saturated, is there gonna be a lot of turnover? Are there gonna be, is there gonna be a lot more need for, I, I just, I still, I think I view it also not in the context of starting, but maintaining and, and progressing and as technology moves. Like let's say that you need to, a social equity applicant needs to buy a piece of machinery because they want to enter the manufacturing space or they want to stand up their own testing lab and that's a lot of money. You know, the way that other grant programs that you go for certain things within this same general context, it's, it's that what are you doing to add to you know what you've already got going on and so I see an opportunity for those types of programs especially because they need to be state dollars at this time because of its federal status and other access to other grants that otherwise they might apply for you know through USDA or, or elsewhere are not going to be available so I think to answer your question I think it's ongoing because I don't think we can assume that every social equity applicant that is going to apply in the first year you know, it would be two or three I mean Massachusetts granted they have a different population than we do they're still standing up cohorts of training and education. Yeah, and we don't... They're on their fourth or their fifth now. I mean, fundamentally, this recommendation could hurt us in other ways, essentially. Um, as in, the legislature very much understands that it's not our role to be spending this money. Um, it's their job to do that. And like you said, there's a lot of proposals out there on how to spend it. If we are saying this, um, it's kind of like we're virtue signaling and we're forcing the legislature to say, no, we're going to do this instead. Um, so there, it's putting us, you know, potentially in an unfavorable spot by being overly specific here as a board. I think what I would feel comfortable with is saying the board recommends that the legislature allocate a percentage of the excise tax to annually, annually to the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Our, our social equity subcommittee recommended five to 10%. I would be fine with that. Yeah, okay, I'm okay with that. Those are the people that they asked to have an opinion about these mm -hmm. things, so. I'm fine with that, I acknowledge that. Or we could say our advisory committee because- They're also the advisory committee. 
Yes, I would be fine with that. Okay. Is that all right, Brynn? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And do you want to do the same for the second bullet? Yeah. Okay. Is that the number? Is that the twenty percent? Was that from them, or is that something that? NCB? That was from them. That okay. was from. Yep. Okay. I, I believe that that came directly from the subcommittee's work. Okay. Yeah. And do we want to include the rest of their bullets on how the fund should be spent? Or do we want to leave it at those three? Or take them out altogether. Or take them out altogether. Um, I would almost take them out altogether. Okay. Okay. Rather yeah. than. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. You ready to move on? We're going to move, like, switch gears here and talk about online ordering and delivery now. So the legislative language here is that we were required to report on um, the experience of other jurisdictions with regulated adult use cannabis um, and whether they accept online ordering for store pickup and whether they deliver and whether to offer these services here in Vermont. So just a summary here is that there really is not a consensus on delivery, but most um, other states do allow for it. And of all of the states that recently passed adult use but haven't yet fully stood up their adult use sales, none of them prohibit delivery except for Vermont. Um, and some states that originally didn't allow for delivery now do, like Colorado and Massachusetts. And then for online ordering, again, there's no consensus, but the vast majority of existing adult use states do allow for it. So here's a summary of, or just kind of a state-by-state -state review of who allows a delivery and who doesn't. Um, another page of states that do and don't allow for delivery. All, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, all these recently um, established programs don't have sales yet, but they do provide for delivery licenses. So even though this says NA, it really should be, yes. Eventually. <laughs> and then online ordering. Um, the synopsis here is that most states do allow for it. The only states that specifically don't are Maine, I believe, is Montana? And Montana. So um, the recommendation here is, or actually just a summary of the advantages and disadvantages for delivery. Um, are that the advantages are that it increases consumer convenience. Um, it transitions sales from the illicit market to the regulated market. Since there is delivery now on the illicit market, uh, it makes sense to provide it on the regulated market too, so people who want to have their products delivered can get regulated products delivered. Um, creates jobs and opportunities for small entrepreneurs. Um, since it's a small business type with very low startup costs, potentially, depending on the board's regulations. Some disadvantages to delivery are that it imposes a, an additional regulatory burden on the board. Um, there could be a slight increase in potential public safety issues since there will be more vehicles on the roads with containing cannabis and potentially some cash. Um, but a note here that other states with delivery have not experienced a significant uptick in delivery-related crimes. Um, and finally, that if we were to improperly implement delivery, it could undercut um, other licenses, particularly retail licenses. So same advantages and disadvantages summary for online ordering. Same types of advantages. Increases consumer convenience helps to transition sales from the illicit market to the regulated market by making it easier um, and transactions time, transaction times quicker. Allows for socially distant sales and quicker transaction times. Disadvantages are that additional costs could be passed on to consumers um, and there could be potential payment issues, online payment issues or payment disputes. Can I just ask a clarifying question about <coughs> online ordering? This would be online ordering for like curbside pickup or delivery, right? Not, or? I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, the, however, I'm not, I always associated online ordering with those two issues, um, but I'm not sure. I think it almost would benefit us to be specific that this would be for curbside pickup and delivery. I mean, because, 
correct me if I'm wrong, anyone who's read Act 164, but I think curbside pickup is prohibited. Yes. So um, I think we really should say that, especially during the pandemic, I mean, this, that's when Massachusetts implemented online ordering and curbside pickup mm -hmm. as a way to avoid having to enter the store. Okay. Um, so I think we should be specific here that online ordering, but I think you could also do online ordering for non-curbside pickup. If you just order in advance and go to the store and pick up in person. Right. Right. right, but you can't have it FedEx. No. Right. That's, I think that's, what, that's right. where I think we need to be specific, okay. is that if this is not online ordering to be shipped to your house. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. However, like in the delivery context, it is though. Right, but like if you're in Brattleboro and you want something shipped from the Northeast Kingdom or you want to order something, you can't have it. USTS is not going to pick it up and bring it to your house for you. I think I I was talking to somebody about this who asked me that question. I was like, no, I don't think that that's the intent. <laughs> I think our intent is like you can order it and it's available to you somehow, not not shipped to your home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Order. So I think we should just yeah be explicit here yeah. uh, about the curbside pickup specifically. I mean, I think the delivery yeah, is implied, but I think we should maybe just say online ordering for either in-store pickup, curbside pickup, or delivery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to move on to the recommendations, which are that the legislature authorized delivery, including the creation of a delivery license, which we're going to talk about in the next section of the report, um, and that the legislature allow for consumers to place online orders um, for both delivery and in-store pickup. And I guess the thought here is to add curb, or curbside pickup as well. Um, and then a recommendation that the legislature allow the board to figure out how to regulate delivery so that we can implement it in a way that works for everybody, consumers, entrepreneurs, and um, licensees. We're good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to the next section. Now we're going to talk specifically about um, the additional license types that we're recommending. So this is the legislative language, whether um, legislature should consider adding additional license types including these three particular ones, craft cooperative, delivery, or special events. Um, so some narrative here about the board's goals for additional license types. Um, referencing our mission statement, uh, the board's focused on setting up an equitable and diverse marketplace with lots of opportunities for small businesses. Um, so the goal is really to create uh, an accessible industry without high barriers um, our initial set of licenses that the legislature established really just create kind of the framework for the industry to develop. Um, and those, the licenses that the board is recommending here will further the goal of social equity, um, access for social equity applicants and small entrepreneurs by creating additional opportunities um, for social equity applicants and small entrepreneurs and as well as allowing some local businesses and other industries to benefit from cannabis legalization. And then the last bullet just notes that we may all, we're may we also going to recommend some future license types that we may not be recommending now, but um, that should be considered once the market has gotten a chance to mature a little bit. So a review of the current license types. Um, we may have a couple changes to this. Um, slide based on some earlier decisions. So a review of these license types here is our outdoor tiers um, and our indoor tiers and then our mixed tier. Can you go back up to the outdoor tiers? Yep. Just wanted to, I know we talked about this, the or up to 125 plants. Right, so this was based on the last board meeting where you talked about um, creating an equivalent plant count for that small yeah. outdoor cultivator. Huh. Yep. <laughs> and I think it's still the right ratio. Um, yeah. Uh, you know what? We can fix it later. <laughs> this the thing I'm thinking of. Okay. I think that, that uh, is fine the way it is right there. Okay. 
No, they're cryptic, I guess. <laughs> well, I just think that that should be the ratio of indoor to outdoor, um, not necessarily for the other license, the other tiers, but that should be the ratio in a small outdoor cultivator should allow, be allowed if they're going to only grow 50 plants outside, they should be allowed to use the rest of it. Are you, um, are you thinking about your mixed year, trying to yeah, make that more? Potentially a mixed year, or just, you know, if you want to use some portion so of you're your saying square footage for in a greenhouse or something like that, and you could have a certain number of plants and a certain number of square feet. Oh. But just if that 1,125 is the right ratio, um, I want to just be clear on that, but that you might have a mix, a small outdoor cultivator might have a mix of square footage and plants. It don't, you don't have to choose one or the other. But we can clarify that yep. elsewhere. That can be clarified in regulations. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. We're like it in every corner of our program. Can we go back to the next year? We, um, in one of our public comments, we, and maybe this is what you were just trying to address, um, there was a concern that there's nowhere to go with the mixed here. There's no, um, it's, it's only 50 plants, you can't go up from that. Did we want to have GMR, that was um, the public comment session that we had between Christmas and New Year's. Yeah, I think we did hear something like that and we kicked around more mixed, yeah. more mixed years. Is that something that we need to address now or is it something that we can address? Uh, we certainly don't need to address it right now, okay. um, but yeah, I think the kind of ideal to address it would be having some sort of graduation like to higher tiers. Uh, you know, I know, you know, other states, if you're using 85% of your canopy and you're selling 85% of your product, mm -hmm. you can jump up to the next tier. So we can think about something like that. I don't think we have to do it right here unless we want to. I do think you should work out your additional tiers sooner rather than later just because ways and means is right. trying to move quickly to be built. Um, well, I mean, one, one thing that, yeah, we've talked about is saying, you know, there's this prohibition on any one cultivator or any one entity holding multiple of the same license types. I guess the question is, is an outdoor cultivation a different license type than an indoor cultivation? And could you combine the two so long as you're under the maximum tier, your aggregate is under the maximum tier. Meaning no Meaning no bigger than the highest, like 37.5 right. or 40,000 or right. whatever the case. Yeah, I, I think I think I view those as personally as different license types, yeah. considering that they're different grow methodologies. Yeah. And I think that might be a way that we can. So that would be, that should probably be a recommendation if you wanted to do that to because um, yeah. I think it's just a cultivation license type. Right. So we'd have yeah. to recommend that they be I think we're getting quite, yeah, I think we're getting questions about this. Right. Um, so regardless, we need to provide clarity to folks that, you know, might want to grow outdoors and then turn around and, and grow indoors. And if they want to go for more than one license, yeah, we might need authority to do so, but I don't see why that would be disallowed it otherwise. When's your next meeting with Ways and Means? You know? <laughs> Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. Well, why don't we, um, how about this? How about we wait for our public comment period today and then revisit this afterwards and give us some time to think about this. Okay. Because it's a big change, obviously. Yes, and I came to it. I just didn't want to forget it. Yeah, that, no. that came it's out. Something it was, I was going to mention it. it right before you did. Yeah. Yeah. But would there be a need for more mixed tiers if you can hold multiple cultivation licenses of a different variety at the same time? You know what I mean? It almost feels like we get rid of the mixed tier and just say, if you're, you can have a tier one, you can have two tier one licenses, outdoor and indoor, or you can have, you know, but I think at some point we would want to say you can't have both, you know, like if you're like tier five, you can't have two <laughs> tier five licenses. Well, you can't, you can't have two cultivation licenses, right? Like I know that we've said that it's, you can only have one cultivation license, right? So then you need more mixed tiers, is what yeah. you're saying? 
So it's essentially the same thing with just yeah. semantics. Because we could say, I mean, cultivation mix here is 1,000 square feet indoors and 125, 125 outdoors. Anyway, can we think about that some more uh, yep. after we finish this report? <laughs> okay, <laughs> here are your retail license tours. We've all seen those. Um, manufacturing license tiers, so I did have time to add a tier three manufacturing license type that could process and manufacture up to $10,000 worth of cannabis products on an annual basis. And um, put in a sentence that they could use any infusion or extraction method that would be allowed for tier two manufacturing. But you may want to. No, I, that's, that was my intent, thank okay. you. Sure. It's, it, it's, I mean, it's tied to sales though, right? It's mm -hmm. not $10,000 worth. It's no right. $10,000 in sales for cannabis products. Yep. Very similar like in the, oh, in the ag world. If you sell over okay. thousand dollars of product, you have to be registered in certain ways that you otherwise wouldn't. So there's, okay. you know, I think it's fine the way it's worded there. They're supporting precedent, yeah. I guess. Okay. Okay. Yep. There are lots going for right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, other license types. <laughs> yeah. there. So this is the slide recommending additional license types. Um, so as it's drafted now, um, the board's recommending a delivery license type and a temporary events pilot license type. Um, and so, then, so if you read that temporary events pilot program language, that's why I kind of arrived at thinking you could do things that I was putting forward, except for the producers being part of this, you know, fest style mm -hmm. event so I think right and I think the way it's ambiguous enough right there that we can work out the details I think it's ambiguous enough the way it's written there that it would allow for what you asked for and so right. I, I yeah. think we can um, we can make this as part of our report and we can work out in the meantime exactly what, what it means what this means and what it looks like Okay. Last two bullets here um, kind of synthesize the board's comments on the co-op license type, but there's nothing prohibiting um, somebody from forming a cooperative business on their own. And with the availability of the lower tier cultivation licenses and all of the board's endeavors to encourage outdoor cultivation, um, no need for a separate craft cooperative license. To, in, to increase the number of small cultivators at this point. Great. Okay. So here's the recommended license, the delivery recommended license type. So it would allow a standalone business to apply for a delivery license. Um, and that person could deliver between um, a retail licensee and the consumer. So they could contract with multiple um, retail licensees aggregate their um, product um, within limits that are set by the board so they could make multiple deliveries um, and then consumers could place orders online for delivery um, so the benefits would be that it would increase access to tested and regulated product um, and it would treat cannabis more like other regular other consumer products um, where sales are shifting to online ordering and home delivery and it would create another license type that has low barriers to entry to um, assist small entrepreneurs and social equity applicants. And then there's a sentence there that the board will create an, ex an exclusivity period for social equity applicants. And then some safety restrictions on the bottom there, which are that products and cash would have to be secured during transport. Vehicles would be tracked by GPS. That comes from our proposed rule um, two. Sales rules, including purchase limits and ID checks, would apply to delivery transactions. Um, and there would not be delivery permitted between a wholesaler or other type, other cannabis licensee. Um, they would just be limited to retail 
storefront licensees to avoid undercutting the retail establishments. I'm good. With that. Can we go back to one slide? I'm sorry to continue to. Or actually, let's do the, the temp go forward first. I didn't realize the next slide was temporary events, too. Uh -huh. I, I was just going to ask in that, would you two be comfortable changing one word in? Read this first, and then we can go back, and I'll show you what I mean. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is the temporary event recommended license type. So this would allow um, the existing some existing businesses to host events. Um, where cannabis could be sold for on-site consumption within designated spaces. Um, and the idea would be that that existing business would get a permit from the board to host the event and partner with a licensed cannabis business that would be responsible for um, bringing the cannabis and selling it and making sure it's secure. Local authorities would have jurisdictional approval over the specific plans for the specific event. Um, benefits, additional revenue streams to existing businesses, potential increase in tourism revenue, allowing for on-site consumption in a limited manner uh, before doing a more broad site, broad on-site consumption program, um, providing consumers with access to on-site consumption in a limited way, um, starting to treat cannabis like alcohol for on-site consumption. And the safety restrictions down at the bottom are um, that sales and consumption would be limited to a particular area that would be age-gated and require an ID check. Um, there would have to be an in-place transportation plan to prevent people from driving after they consume, um, training and educational requirements for any employees, security and sales requirements um, would apply. And then lastly, the board would limit the number of licensees um, and permits before expanding the program. The word that is, I wanted to change is on this page too, but but if we're gonna suggest on-site consumption now, do we need to adjust some of the benefits? Um, what exactly are you looking at? Um, you know, we say to demonstrate proof of concept before attempting broader on-site consumption and event licensing in limited and unique ways, but if I don't know if we need to include those bullets if we're also going to just suggest that on-site consumption happen. Yeah. I think I think it's important to tie on-site consumption to the temporary event pilot as well. Okay, I just didn't know if that was necessary. Yeah, well, do you want to say that? Sorry, demonstrate proof of concept. If we're going to, is that under? We would just need some tweaks, I think, to yeah. the language yeah. if you're also recommending yeah. the on-site on yeah. consumption. Yeah. So the first bullet on details, I just would suggest, um, just to give us more flexibility, I think I would like to change the word for to and between consumers and on-site consumption. I think I, I recognize your perspective on this, but I just think as, as Julie and I both have kind of said, it's going to be, I think people are going to be taking product home regardless if they can sell it or not. Um, not just buying it to consume on-site. So if it said cannabis products could be sold to consumers and on on-site consumption within designated spaces, it might provide us a little bit more flexibility in crafting a, in a, a pilot program that we all would agree on. Julie? Yeah, so you're, you're saying that for on-site consumption and to take home, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if yeah. we, I, I think, if I'm being realistic, people are going to take home product regardless of whether or not we say that they can from these events. So, well, you might purchase, I mean, it depends on how much would be sold, but you might purchase something that you don't consume all of it. Or else it's just going to be pre rolls. Yeah. Um, and you're, you know, if you can sit down and smoke and eat the weed, then more power to you in a very limited amount of time. But, you know, I think it's going to be more palatable. Right. Even a pre roll, somebody might only smoke some of, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so Particularly at an event. food for thought, I think mm -hmm. that gives us, and we can still limit it to just on-site on consumption on a case-by-case -case basis, but it might give us more flexibility depending on how we decide to move should this get through the legislature. So I would agree with that. I did, in that same bullet, it says allow existing businesses like ski resorts and wedding venues, and that seems a little different than what we talked about earlier today. Right. So I'm unclear as to who the licensee would be. Can, can we just say existing license, uh, never mind, I was going to say existing license holders. 
Um, I mean, I get the intent here. It's just saying it, it might be better to phrase it this way for legislative purposes. I don't know, but. I mean, we could tweak it. I actually think it's fine the way it is because the details really will need to be worked out. Um, so I don't, I mean, you could say, you know, would allow a newly created special event operator to host events with cannabis or cannabis products could be sold. But I actually think it's fine. It's fine the way it is. It seems to exclude things like the Burlington waterfront or you know something that's not tied to a, a business. Um, but I think it's fine the way it is, honestly, because a lot of this will just have to get worked out through a discussion. Um, so I don't have a problem with changing the four to an and. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And making any other tweaks necessary to bring to yep to align this with a recommendation around the social consumption lenses. Okay. So I'm just going to skip this next slide because it's a mistake. So um, this is the potential future license type slide. Um, so in addition to creating the well, so this may be the time to talk about inclusion of on-site consumption. Okay. Because um, now we're getting into the future events, future license types, sorry. So if, if the board does want to move ahead with um, recommending that the legislature create an on-site consumption license, it would be included prior to this slide. But it sounds like that's what you've, that's what you've decided. Yeah. 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 And I think regardless of, if we're looking at events here, I think regardless of language tweaks that we put in the special event pilot program, I mean, somebody could still seek to be an event license holder where they can more easily host specific limited retail events, like it says there, not under the one-off ability that you would have to do under our special event temporary pilot program license. I'm saying there's still benefit to having that license type in, in, the, in the report. So no change. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. It's been a long day. It's been a weird day. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important day, but a weird one nonetheless. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> that blank stare. <laughs> so no change. So these two um, retail farmer tier and event license would be kind of a future recommendation. Um, that we're recommending shouldn't be implemented now until the market has um, had an opportunity to mature. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next section of the report. And this is um, the legislative language here is to recommend whether the board should require that cannabis um, have a minimum amount of CBD um, to prevent the cannabis induced psychosis that occurs in some users cannabis and cannabis products. So a reminder, this slide just has a kind of reiterates what the report, the November 1st report included um, about THC potency. And that was that the um, recommendation that cannabis licensees be allowed to produce extractions with a concentration of 60% or greater for purposes of incorporating that extraction into um, other cannabis products that otherwise comply with that prohibited product statute. You also recommended removing from the prohibited products list solid concentrates um, with a THC concentration of 60% or above only for adults 25 years of age and older so that, this, that the board could regulate the manufacture and sale of those products. And then lastly, there was a recommendation in that report that was made in consultation with the Agency of Agriculture that the board's uh, jurisdiction also include manufacture and sale of um, Delta-containing products and any future synthetic cannabinoids with similar properties to um, THC and whether, whether or not they were derived from hemp or from high THC cannabis. So, um, kind of a summary here of what uh, existing research shows about minimum amounts of CBD. Um, there really is qu quite a lack of existing cannabis research um, due to the federal scheduling of cannabis. 
Um, the studies that do exist are kind of all over the map, funded by um, particular interest groups, and that really creates the ability to cherry pick studies to support almost any position. So um, after reviewing the available studies and accepting their limitations, the board does not believe there's evidence that's sufficient to impose a legal minimum um, CBD amount or a, or a ratio of CBD in legal cannabis products. So here's a review of those studies that you've reviewed. Um, the studies that support policies that would implement a potency limit often point to this National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report that provided that cannabis use is likely to increase the risk of developing schizophrenia and other psychosis. But then there's opposing um, studies like the um, like a linked study in The Lancet that found that increased cannabis consumption rates did not lead to an increased psychosis rate. And another one published by a Journal of Abnormal Psychology, which also concluded that cannabis use and psychosis may be correlated, but the concentration doesn't have any causal effect on the risk of psychosis. And then lastly, this is a, um, a reference to the Massachusetts Com Commission's report. They very recently undertook um, a comprehensive review of all of the studies that, um, that look at this issue. And they concluded that um, after reviewing all that available research and data, there is not sufficient evidence to recommend any specific concentration limit. So as a result, um, the Vermont Board is going to provide a similar recommendation. This, this was this recommendation was reviewed by our advisory committee, um, including I think there's at least two public health experts on that advisory committee, and I didn't hear an objection from them. You know, not a positive vote from them, but at least one of them. Was. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, so this is a summary of the recommendation. Not enough scientific evidence to support any. Um, minimum CBD amount, and the recommendation is that the legislature also not impose any minimum amount or ratio of CBD until there's sufficient scientific evidence to support that policy. So the last part of the report is the paraphernalia recommendations. Here's the legislative language recommendations on display and sale of cannabis related paraphernalia that is sold by persons who are not licensed as cannabis establishments or dispensaries. So um, this is often dual use paraphernalia, um, can be used with other legal products like tobacco and they're marketed that way. So attempting to further regulate that paraphernalia will probably just encourage folks to sell it, um, marketing it as just for use with tobacco. Um, there's quite a bit of um, complication involved in regulating um, the display and sale of these products. Would require a whole lot of oversight and enforcement that the board may not want to engage in, um, especially since the paraphernalia itself doesn't create any public health or safety concerns, and cannabis is going to be subject to regulations on its sale and display. Um, so requiring sale of these, um, this kind of paraphernalia only at board licensed facilities would cost money and take a lot of time and probably be unnecessary. Um, and it's the board's primary responsibility to regulate cannabis and cannabis products and regulating the sales of paraphernalia would require a whole lot of personnel time and additional funding to the board. So the recommendation is that the legislature not impo impose any additional regulations or restrictions on cannabis related paraphernalia and that the at the legislature not assign any additional duties to the board um, in overseeing or regulating the sale or display of this paraphernalia. The end. Thank you, Bryn. Thank you, Bryn. Thank you. <laughs> so um, any discussion of this other than the points that we have raised already? Bryn, do you want us to vote on this today? Um, I think that would be, if you're, we're not going to have another board meeting this week, that would be good for you to vote on it since we're going to file it on Friday. Friday. Okay. 
And so um, the additions that I remember are on-site consumption, the 30% THC cap on flour, and um, whether couple, we need a couple tweaks to the language. Remo yeah, some tweaks to the language and the social equity recommendations, specifically the removal of that 20% allocation and instead referencing what the social equity subcommittee recommended for a percentage of allocation of yeah. the tax revenue. Okay. Um, and some additional language about um, that reinvest community reinvestment fund. So then what we need to discuss then uh, to help Brand, is it's going to be a part of this report, which maybe it doesn't need to be, is the additional mixed tier lighting. Um, and so I think the concept that's in my mind would be allowing uh, the thousand foot indoor cultivator to have kind of a small cultivator mixed tier and then maybe a, a step up or potentially two steps up, I think would be the most simple way to do it. You get your thousand feet indoor, you can do 50 plants outdoor as a tier one, maybe a tier two, you could do 125 plants, maybe a tier three, you could have some additional allocation. I think that's probably the simplest way to do it. And again, my goal in doing this would be to encourage outdoor cultivation. Um, so do you want to pause for some public comment on that? Do we want to discuss it first? I mean, I, I like where you're, where your head's at, I was just going to suggest before you said it. I think I've, I've at least heard from one per person who was going to seek something higher than a small cultivator indoor license and wanted to figure out how to grow outdoors as well. So if we can alleviate that by kind of figuring out the math <laughs> for the other tiers, as long as you don't go above our largest tier, um, at least giving the first couple, the smallest tiers, that option, um, I would be happy with that. Yeah, I mean, I think we really have to just, you know, as David and Brynn are looking at us, we have to call them mixed tier licenses. So we have to not just say you can have a tier two indoor and a tier two outdoor. We need to actually define them. I got that. I was talking so, generally. Yeah, yeah, so I'm trying to think how far up the scale they want to go. I mean, I, I don't know if I necessarily feel, feel comfortable about talking to, you know, Carrie and other folks, if we just say you have to keep your aggregate canopy under, you know, 25,000 square feet, I feel like that might. Can you say the three tiers, 50 plants? We have the 50 plant. Yeah. In some ways, it makes sense to pop that up to 125, but yeah. again, we presented this to the legislature multiple times at this point, so maybe it makes sense just to leave it. 1,000 yeah. indoor, 50 outdoor, and then have another one that's a thousand indoor and 125 outdoor and what was your third and then maybe go one tier up i don't know like 2500 indoor and 250 outdoor yeah. i don't know so i like that concept yeah um yeah i think we've in the past we've gotten public comment before we voted on the reports and things so maybe we would have do that yeah and you know i'll still Raise the flag for my little incubator micro license too, but that doesn't need to be the top main topic of conversation. Considering we probably need to go the one here public comment on it, the two trying to do a cost benefit analysis quickly on whether or not it makes sense to move that license type forward right now. Considering everything we're trying to do for small cultivators, that I completely recognize that. So, well, um, yeah. So I guess. You know, thank you all in the public for sticking sticking it out with us today. Um, our numbers have dwindled a little bit, obviously, <laughs> to be expected, I suppose. Um, so, yes, we would like to um, seek public comment. Um, you know, you can talk about whatever you want, but you know, what we have to decide today is whether we want to have more mixed tier licenses. Um, so please feel free to discuss anything, but it'd be great um, for folks that are thinking about seeking cultiva cultivation licenses, whether you think this is a good idea, a bad idea, um, what, what it should look like, et cetera. So um, we'll start, there's no one in the room, so we'll start with the people that joined via the link. Mm -hmm. Nelly, if you could kind of just walk us through the order that Absolutely. people raise their hands. Absolutely. Uh, first up, we have Dan. Hey, 
Hey, everybody. Hey, Dan. Um, yeah, thanks for, uh, for giving me a moment to speak. Uh, my name is Dan Pomerantz. I actually wrote to you guys um, a few letters of recommendation as well. Uh, that's up on your web website. But yeah, in regards to the mixed tier licensing, I think it's really important to consider, um, I know that Vermont is a small state, um, but uh, these limitations are potentially really going to restrict the amount of product that's available into the market. <clears throat> and I think that you guys should look into considering how much people can grow with, with certain square footage. So for instance, I know that I'm looking to get the max tier of outdoor, um, but the thing is I'm looking to diversify the products that I grow, and I'm only looking to have a small amount of indoor. Um, it's, it's difficult to approach the market with only one type of product. So 37,000, you know, 500 square feet of outdoor might grow a decent amount, but it's really not that much if you have, you know, a demand for your product. Um, and what I'm personally looking to do is have, you know, 1,000 to 2,500 square feet of indoor, which to me is a very small, meager amount, you know, enough to have a very limited amount of product to diversify what I offer to the market. Um, so for the mixed tiers, you know, I would ask you guys to consider um, <clears throat> just looking into not limiting people to, you know, who may want to grow the, the top tier of outdoor um, <clears throat> to not being able to still have a small amount of indoor. I, I think there should be some balance. You obviously don't want people having the top tier of both indoor and outdoor. Um, but, you know, being a top tier producer of, of one type of cultivation and then a smaller tier, I think should be an option. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next, we have Old Growth Organics. Hey, guys, thank you for letting me talk. Um, oh, my gosh, this is a difficult meeting. Um, I can't imagine how you guys are feeling, um, but we're doing it. Um, yeah, so mixed tier. Um, I was, I'm really disappointed that it's not on here yet, but it sounds like by the end of the meeting, you guys are coming around and wanting to address it. So thank you so much for uh, revisiting it. Um, I, so to remind you of last week, um, I have a business that is all organic um, and trying to grow as naturally as I can and also take a look at energy consumption. I'm growing some indoor in Maine right now um, and the energy consumption is ludicrous. Um, so it's brought me to realize that there needs to be an alternative because as I think it was Dan that was just saying, it's really about like diversity of product. Outdoor, um, it can be turned into concentrates. You can sell it as flour and all of these things, but it's not the same as indoor flour that people expect. Um, so there needs to be some availability to that, not only for the market demand, um, but for businesses to succeed. Um, and also, I feel like this is an easy win with you guys because it would it would also address the people that are frustrated about the thousand square foot um, not being just flower canopy. Um, it would you know help kind of ease that frustration. But also, I think one of your guys' mission statements is to encourage and facilitate outdoor uh, mixed light growing. So I this this is it. Um, so I'll send the recommendations to Nelly or maybe on the website, but this is what I was thinking uh, roughly, is to have at least a thousand square foot indoor and then 75 plants outdoor. But that's just, that's just minimum uh, because you really can't, you really, I think, need to just scrap square footage for outdoor. Um, it just doesn't work the same way. The plants are so much bigger. How you do it is, is just so different. And it's a lot, it's very laborious if you're doing it organically. Um, so I would just do plant count for outdoor. Um, then go up to 2,000 square feet indoor and 150 plants outdoor. This is following the tiers that you guys already created for outdoor and indoor. And then lastly, um, 3,000 square foot indoor and 225 plants outdoor. This doesn't address um, Dan's issue, so sorry Dan. Um, so I don't know how you would do that, I haven't given it thought yet, but at least for someone that's just trying to um, like generally enter the market in a rounded way, uh, this would I think be the best way forward. Um, and then lastly, um, there's a little bit, I have a little frustration, and I know your guys' intentions are really good with this, but focusing on people who are thinking about getting into the market and starting this like incubation period, um, 
from my experience, one, people, if they're growing in their house, they're growing in their house already. And as far as getting um, used to regulation and all of that, if you're serious about your grow, that happens naturally. Um, if you're serious about a business and serious about your grow, it should happen. A great example of this is electricity, right? That's a really difficult thing to um, manage in a grow when you're not used to something like dealing with um, those kinds of regulations. So maybe you have a bunch of extension cords that are going and you're like, oh, this isn't great, but this is all I can do right now. You, by the time you're making a little bit of profit or getting going, those are the things you're addressing if you're, if you're gonna succeed in a business period. You're addressing those things on your own. Um, people don't need a hand holding, I don't think, uh, for regulations. And also, um, I don't think people that are just getting started in this, we need to be focusing on and giving you know, we, there's, you guys have enough on your plate. That doesn't need to be one of them because there are people that have been risking their lives in doing this market um, for the majority of their lives. You know, it's like, let's focus on those people and like get this ball rolling. So anyways, holy moly for a meeting, you guys. Um, but thank you for all you're doing and uh, I'll catch you at the next one. Thank you. All right, next we have Rick Fox. Hi, everybody. Um, you hearing me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, it's great to see the uh, 125 plants uh, equivalency to 1,000 square feet. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Jesse, uh, some of your comments about the outdoor plants that you have, uh, outdoor plant cavity you just mentioned there. Yeah, 100% agree. I, I might have missed it, though, with, with the higher tiers on outdoor. Uh, are you following? It sounds like maybe you're not, uh, or have decided yet, um, following that same formula of if 125 plants is equivalent to 1,000 square feet, then you know 3,000 square feet would be 375 plants, and and so on and so on uh, upwards on the on the outdoor tiers. Is, is that is that what you're recommending at this point, or still trying to figure that out? Still trying to figure it out. Okay. All right. Well, then, uh, you know, I, I would I would strongly encourage the board to consider, uh, you know, with 125 plants being equivalent. Uh, again, this is the mixed use. This would just be the outdoor. Uh, if 125 plants is equivalent to a thousand square feet, which which, which it is, uh, I think it would be great to carry that formula forward uh, all the way up through all the rest of the tiers going on up, because really the same dynamics come into play whether you're interplanting or retaining that data vegetation for pollinator predator, predator habitat or dealing with microsite characteristics and water and things like that. Um, you know, I think that 125 plant equal to 1,000 square feet indoor, uh, you know, would work well all the way up through the tiers in the outdoor. So, thank you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, next is Amelia. Hi guys, um, I've got a couple points and I'll try to make it short because I know this is going way longer than you probably anticipated. Um, so first, the additional tiers for that small mixed cultivation license, I think that's an awesome idea. Um, I think increasing the number of outdoor plants will be really helpful to people that make that initial investment because outdoor is expensive to grow if you're doing it organically and sustainably. Um, I just also wanted to kind of bring back to the table that I did introduce the idea of a supplemental caregiver license that was specific to the craft tier that would allow somebody with a craft tier license, a mixed tier, I'm sorry, a mixed tier license to uh, caregive for five patients, which would then bump their uh, plant count per patient. Um, so just wanted to mention that one more time. Kind of circling back to the event permits, when you're thinking about event permitting, you also have to think about, I come from like the wedding business and I help plan cannabis weddings. Um, part of what happens there, so one, the vendors, you won't necessarily have a cannabis vendor that charges per product at the event. What you're more likely going to see is that the couple pays a cannabis vendor a set amount, and then it kind of works like an open bar where up to a certain point product is paid for and attendees who are 21 or over would just have to like show their ID and they would get product. Um, 
in saying that, also, you're going to see people who are hosting cannabis weddings that want to give out cannabis as flavors. And because of this, they're purchasing in an amount that might go over their allotted you know, cannabis purchase allowance or their holding allowance, how much they're allowed to have on them at a time, um, something to consider. And third, uh, you might also just in general for cannabis events see that the host of the event wants to purchase a certain amount of cannabis to give away for free at the event. So with that, you have to consider um, like a temporary wholesale um, purchasing allowance for temporary event permit holders. Um, and that was all I wanted to say. I appreciate everything you guys do. Thanks, Amelia. Next is Sean LaRock. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I would echo everything Amelia said as it relates to special events and also add in the potential for con solventless concentrate makers being able to have an appearance at those events and produce concentrate and have it sampled live on site for any number of types of events. Um, otherwise, I just got a quick little list here. I know you had covered paraphernalia towards the last part of it. Um, and you guys are trying to not engage with that, but at least whatever help that you could give us of making sure that the bait tax does not get applied to any paraphernalia or consumption tools uh, related to cannabis or, or medicating patients. Um, if you can help us out with that would be great. Otherwise, uh, I didn't see any mention of solventless production in tier two or tier three manufacturing. Tier three just said $10,000. It mentioned nothing about other means of scale, other means of production. So some clarity on solventless uh, production types and where that would fit into manufacturing tiers. Uh, delivery and online sales. Uh, if that isn't done right, it's just going to continue to perpetuate the legacy market. You could get on Instagram right now and find 50 people that are willing to deliver you whatever you want in the next 10 minutes. Um, I think those are, those are mostly my main points. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, next is Graham. Hey there, folks. This is Graham Unings, Group Denoff, Policy Director at Rural Vermont, small farmer here in Marshfield. Uh, like folks said, this has been an epic meeting. I'm sure everyone's hungry and ready to stop thinking about this for a little. Um, but I do have a bunch of notes. Uh, we're also a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, which I neglected to mention. Um, in general, you know, I appreciate the consideration for home manufacture and home indoor growing below the thousand square feet mark. Um, we also appreciate, you know, Pepper's intention to continue to review rules one and two for greater allowances for small cultivators. You know, in our recommendations, we recommended a similar cottage indoor cultivation license to the CCD of approximately 250 square feet with some appropriate um, uh, accounting for um, the regulatory requirements. Also appreciate the questions around the limitations of municipal oversight and requirements. I think there are still some questions about how far municipalities can reach. Um, we're at least hearing them. Uh, in terms of social equity, you know, you all went over, you know, we made our recommendations and you're aware of them. Um, we'll have to discuss the different definitions you have submitted here today versus what was in rules and get back to you about that. Um, offhand, I think we would support changing language to uh, affect people affected as juveniles as well. As Pepper pointed out, if you're not included, uh, appreciate your work on the THC caps. Certainly appreciate and um, support expungement expansion. Um, and the NACB recommendations related to community development, community reinvestment, CBD uh, fund, uh, the CBD fund meaning the cannabis uh, development fund, excise contributions. Um, in terms of license types of cultivation that folks have been talking about and you've been asking me about, you know, we recommended that outdoor and indoor be considered different types of licenses such that one doesn't need to necessarily choose one or the other and um, you choose one of each. And I think that Dan's example really brings up you know, some of the challenges with we're trying to overly prescribe these as opposed to allowing people to choose what works for them or makes more sense based on their business. People aren't always just going to be trying to, you know, grow the most as folks have attested here, diversifying, having different products, et cetera, is important. 
Um, I'm going to keep going on to a couple other things. I'll cover a lot of material. But on-site consumption, in terms of the options you laid out and asked about, brick and mortar or allowing consumption where tobacco can be consumed, I think my initial response is both. You know, with brick and mortar, you create a business opportunity, a location for consumption which is familiar to people and can be more highly regulated. But it's also a financial requirement beyond purchasing the product itself. It's a problem for rural folks looking for access, considering the safety and compliance issue with highway safety you've all talked about. Um, you know, which is negative. It's like saying if you want to drink, you need to go to a bar. You know, each op option accomplishes different goals. And if you were to choose one, I think the one enabling the most equity of access, the lowest price point, the least amount of stigmatization, which is simply allowing consumption as you start in New York, would be the place to start. Um, and you also bring up the concerns of the prevention community about normalizing cannabis use. And you know, that's exactly what this law, what decriminalization, what recognizing the discriminatory history of this law is trying to do, to destigmatize the plant, the people, communities, businesses, cultures associated with it, who allow more familiarity and normalization. You know, the alternative is continuing to hide, demonize, and shame. And that's not rooted in science, but in discrimination. In terms of the special event um, licenses, we certainly support temporary events beyond direct consumption. Um, I'm a little curious how your special event recommendation you discussed today differs from the still future license that you have in your recommendations that you aren't recommending for now. Um, it, that a number of times, you know, special drug fails are critical for producers, and I will continue to implore you if you want to reduce the risks to address the concerns you brought up, Pepper, in relationship to tracking and point of sale and cash storage. Consider allowing buying clubs, CSAs versus direct sales on farms. You know, the farm could deliver, the CSA members could pick it up at a point. This is essentially what folks are already doing. You know, cultivators are going to have to deliver um, wholesale. They're going to be tracking all of these things for on their farms and for wholesale purposes. Um, so extending this and the trust in these producers, as you discussed with home baking businesses, to some form of accessible direct sales is critical. Um, I don't know how many producers would be interested in selling at events, certainly a lot of them, but there are also a lot of questions. I know from being a farmer, like how many events would it take for someone to pay for differentiated packaging versus retail sales versus wholesaling? It's a very different thing to like upend your life every week or however often to go to a farmer's market. From time required to customer relations to product maintenance and storage. Um, this is the second meeting in which I've heard these concerns about quote unquote undercutting retailers' businesses by offering reasonable licenses for smaller amounts of sales. And I would just reframe this and suggest that in not allowing producers to sell the products they have grown, you're reducing their viability and inequitably limiting their retail sales. I've heard no evidence that producers selling their products directly or small general stores having a small sales section would have any meaningful impact on full retail establishments. In order to understand why retail establishments should be privileged more than producers to sell the products that producers themselves have grown. And I think a question I have in relationship to this is in S188, um, would considering small cultivators agricultural allow for direct sales on farms as producers are allowed to sell products principally produced from their farms on their farms? I'll leave it there. Thanks, Graham. Next is Tito. Hi, everybody. Happy Monday. Uh, I love Kyle's idea for a new license type, or at least where the inspiration is coming from, um, although uh, Chair Pepper's solution could work as well. But that's to, uh, to get the black market involved, you have to meet people where they are. And the black market in Vermont is filled with tiny, tiny growers, like, you know, less than micro, you know, intense, for example. And uh, we don't have, a, a, at least I hadn't throughout my, all my days, I didn't encounter any huge black market mega grows the way you would see out in California or other states. Um, and going from tent to a building is super, super intimidating. And, and I think that's Kyle's main point. So for this to all work, we have to get a, a, that tiny patchwork of <coughs> tents involved in this uh, marketplace. And, and it's just really intimidating to go to a building. Um, and um, I know, you know I'm just going for a, a, a tier two, and I just got my bill from uh, uh, my first bill from the architect that we need just to get us through the permitting process, and that's eighty two hundred dollars just for the architect, just to, just just for his service. Um, so you know there are huge huge barriers to getting into this. Um, next, um, consumption lounges are a must. Um, I, I think we've got to have them, and not only that, let's make it cool and something people want to come and do. Um, I, I think that um, 
I think it's going to be really exciting once that gets going and people have a cool place to go and enjoy cannabis. It's something I personally have been waiting for forever. Um, also, I hear a ton of comparisons to alcohol. Um, and if we're going to go down that route, then I definitely think that the tax should equal what liquor is currently taxed at as well. 10% uh, plus 1% local option. I think that's going to result in way better success um, for, uh, for the future of this market. And lastly, um, I, I, of course, applaud no more further regulation on paraphernalia, and then that's what we will be recommending. Um, but I'm just hoping um, that maybe, uh, you know, I agree with what Sean Rock was saying, that maybe we could uh, also just add a recommendation on clarity on the tobacco vape tax, because you all know that that wasn't meant for cannabis. So, um, you know, maybe just seeking clarity there uh, on this recommendation. That's all. Thank you so much for today's meeting. Thanks, Tito. Uh, next is Dave Silverman. Thank you, Nelly. Um, with respect to mixed tiers, um, you know, I have, I have a bunch of uh, grow clients, I'm not speaking on behalf of any particular one, but I think the general theme uh, that emerges in my conversation with clients is that they want options, and the more options you give them, the happier they will be, and they'll be able to choose their own adventure. Um, so uh, a greater ability to be both indoor and outdoor um, will help some people. And so great, uh, you know, let's do it. Um, you know, Kyle's suggestion for a smaller, sort of like a subset of the 904A uh, small cultivator license, I think could potentially be helpful um, depending on what your 904A exemptions look like. You'll see, uh, James, that I, I, I sent you and, and, and David an email, uh, just kind of pushing back a little bit on what I'm hearing is a uh, narrow interpretation of your 904A authority with respect to uh, energy standards. Uh, so please take a look at that. Uh, well, I lay out some where I've laid out some uh, of my legal analysis of where I, I think we depart in our interpretation of 904A and its reference to 869. Um, and I, I think you know you could do a lot there. Uh, to help people whether or not you have this sub-tier. Um, but if having a sub-tier uh, that's smaller than 1,000 helps you craft even greater 904A allowances for truly, truly small micro-growers, um, then that would also be a good additional option for some people to have. Um, I, I think you know maybe the general theme here is that we don't know what the market's going to look like and we shouldn't be dictating to people what their business models should look like. The role of the board should be to ensure safety for consumers and the general public, not to pigeonhole people into particular sizes of, of grows or particular types. Um, and, and I think, you know, in general, you guys have taken that approach, but, um, you know, sometimes we get, we get stuck in our little thinking silos. So uh, thank you very much and uh, appreciate the work. Thanks, Dave. Um, so uh, we don't generally allow second comments during these types of meetings. Um, oftentimes, it just kind of leads to people commenting on other comments, other comments that have been made. Um, so uh, I see Dan and Old Grower's hands up, but I'm just going to limit the public comments to new commenters. If there's anyone who joined via the link, please. Um, raise your virtual hands, um, and if you've joined by phone, um, you can hit star six if you'd like to make a public comment. No? Okay, um, then we'll close the public comment period there. Um, Bryn, do you need some time to modify the January 15th report any further right now? Do you want us to take a break, or do you if want you to... want to look at it again, I'll need some more time. Um, and we can't look at it before Friday unless we call Not it. Not as a meeting. board, no. I mean, as all three of you, I can certainly show it to you individually. Well, it's no, it's not going to be very much different than what we discussed. Nope. Okay. Just maybe some more mixed tiering. Yeah. Ish. So, so why don't we discuss as a board the mixed tier concept? Um, we heard some specifics. There's certainly a lot of support. Uh, amongst the, this group of people watching right now. Um, it certainly seems to, you know, I think the
comments, although it was in a different context, is to meet people where they're at and try and encourage people to kind of grow outdoors. I think the next year does both of those things. I guess it really just comes down to how big um, do we want to get on this. Yeah, I think, you know, some of the comments relate to plant count outdoors and, and you know, um, without the bounds of Act 164, I think it makes a lot more sense to regulate that way outdoors, but I uh, get a little cautious that we get away from certain definitions around plant canopy and, and what we can do the further out we get making accommodations strictly for small cultivators um, with respect to some of the comments we saw around not the mixed steering, but um, the outdoors and how we tr would potentially try to structure that on a plant count basis and not on a square footage basis. I just, I think we lose the, it would take some work at the legislature perhaps, but I think we lose what's directly in our authority to move plant counts, you know, strictly for outdoors. That being said, I think mixed tearing is a different conversation, but just for the the record, and I know Rick has been an advocate for plant counts for some time, but um, that's kind of where I'm where I'm at at, the, at this point in time on those. Yeah, I agree. So, um, you know, we've been talking about, you know, trying to focus on small cultivators, trying to fill the market with as many small cultivators, trying to saturate it as to the extent that we can with smaller cultivators. So I have some concerns about adding mixed tier cultivation above 2,500 2, square feet indoor, adding additional allowances for outdoor above that level. So, I mean, I think we have our one mixed year license type is 1,000 indoor, 50 outdoor. Oh. <laughs> A new slide just appeared. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think, Thousand indoor and 125 outdoor um, could be a nice kind of graduation point, uh, you know, a next tier up. And then I think we should have a third tier, a 2500 tier that allows. I don't know. I mean, this is where I, I just I don't have the expertise. Um, I see what you're looking at. Yeah, the January 15th report just had some edits made to it. Um, so the next tier up could be 2,500 indoor um, and 200 plants. I just don't know, you know? Or we I just think that makes at, sense. Or right? just leave it at the two tiers. I mean, I think, you could do 2,500 and, you said 2,500 square feet and 200 plants? Does that yeah. make sense? Yep. Yeah, and I think, I think at the end of the day, when we talk about small cultivators, the first two, we might be able to squeeze under that definition and, and work within the bounds of, we heard about 904A, we heard about a lot of things. I don't know if we, I'm not saying I don't want to include it, but this one might be more of your traditional, treated as your traditional license type and might not be considered a small cultivator. If, if that's the case, I'd be in support of it. I just, you know, obviously it's, it's above a thousand square foot. We're without the plan count, you know what I mean? So I think as long as folks acknowledge exemptions will potentially, the further you go in the mixed use, and you know I know other states look at it graduating certain ways, but the higher you get on this mixed tier, the more regulatory oversight will be there because you will not be considered a small cultivator. Right. Do we want to make that recommendation? Yes, I think we should include that in this report. So three tiers, three mixed tiers. Um, and I just don't know if the ratios are right, but it honestly it doesn't really matter at this point. You know, we can get public comment on them, we can adjust them. Um, so why don't we just use those three? So it would be 1,050, tier two would be 1,000 and 125, tier three would be 2,500 indoor and 200 outdoor. Yeah, okay. And Bryn's already made that edit, it looks like. So, um, other than that, um, I, I think we yeah. could. Uh, I was just going to say, I appreciate how folks that are trying to be larger want clarity too. But, you know, I think we can, where we're at right now is 
is focusing on smaller cultivators, and that's where I want to keep our focus. Right. I mean, my problem with just changing all outdoors strictly to a plant count is... I don't know what's going on. I just don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Someone's on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> all right. um, <laughs> Someone might fall through the ceiling at some point. Um, I just don't know how big, you know. If, well, yeah, again, you know, the, thirty-seven five. If we use the hundred thousand square feet indoor equals one hundred twenty-five plants, we use that ratio. I think, yeah, yeah. I think, again, for folks listening, that thirty-seven five was crafted intentionally for Act Two Fifty purposes. The further out we get from certain square footages, the, the more Act 250 kind of comes directly into what we're trying to accomplish. So those numbers were not necessarily pulled out of thin air. I don't wanna get into an Act 250 and talk about 10 acre towns and one acre towns after a four hour meeting in my brains. Not 100% there, but you know, I think the further, again, like the def, there is a definition of plant canopy and we made special accommodations for small cultivators and that outdoor tearing with some of the, you know, ability that we have written in statute. But I think the further out we get for with plan counts, not only spatially, it, it gets unwieldy, but we get a little bit further away from how certain things are structured within 164, which could jeopardize more than just the fees associated with them. Yep. So are you comfortable with these three tiers or? Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm saying just on the, trying to assign a plan count of a five or a 37 five you know acre outdoor cultivation okay. tier to a plant count we'll, we'll start to get pushed back across the street so um the changes Brenda, that you are going to make i'm thinking that we could just accept this report vote it out with acknowledging the changes one is on on-site consumption there will be a recommendation around that um, the other is the, the modifications to the um community business development funds and the community reinvestment fund, right. as we discussed. And then was there a, a third change? Just the, Just the cultivation mixed year. Mixed year. Okay, so why don't we, if I could ask for a motion um, to approve or accept the report, um, you know, as drafted with those edits. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great, all right. Anything else, um, Julie, Kyle, Bryn, David, Nelly, you want to talk about? Not today, but I'm sure you want to make that. <laughs> <laughs> Not today, but I, I would like to circle back to that incubator license type at some point. You know, Tito's comments in line with a lot of folks that I talk to. Right, and I really think for me, it's not a no. It's really just a how is the, if we make sure. accommodations under 904A which ones are we not going to make for a thousand that we would make for micro or, I or incubator. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Well, there's nothing else on the agenda. I just remind um, everyone that we do have a, another board meeting um, dedicated to public comment on our rules one and two proposed rules one and two on Friday at 11. Um, physical location is here in our offices, but we will live stream the event or the meeting as well. And um, nothing else. I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Thanks for everyone who stuck it out with us on the live stream. Thank you to Orca Media. <laughs>